109 players. 206 men and 103 women are here for the 2023 FIDE World Cup. It's the premier knockout tournament in over-the-board chess. All of these players have one goal, to become a candidate for the World Championship. Only three players in each tournament will earn this distinction. The winners will also earn a combined 160 grand in US dollars. Not bad. Still, Carlsen is the favorite in pretty much any tournament he plays. And Magnus Carlsen seals the deal with a draw. He makes it to the finals of the FIDE World Cup for the first time ever. 18-year-old Pragnananda advances to the finals to fight against Magnus Carlsen for the FIDE World Cup. What a final that's going to be. This is the 2023 FIDE World Cup. We are back, the beautiful, the lovely trophy at the 2023 World Cup live from the chess city, the capital of Azerbaijan, Baku. This is the long-awaited final between Magnus Carlsen, the highest-rated player in chess history, the longtime world champion, and the Indian phenom, Ramesh Babu Pragnananda, who has shocked the entire chess world with a Cinderella run that parallels... Some of the greatest performances in chess history. That in front of you there is the chessboard, which will be used to contest this two-game final. It's been an absolutely epic event, and we are back, Peter. It is once again a pleasure to be commentating with you. I'm Grandmaster Daniel Narditsky, Grandmaster Peter Aleko alongside me once again. How excited are you for what promises to be one of the most epic World Cup finals in history? Yeah, hello, Tanya. Hello, everyone. Super excited. Yeah, you mentioned epic. Uh, that's that's what comes to my mind as well. It's uh, just sensational lineup between uh, the very young Pragnananda against Magnus Carlsen. A dream come true for both players. We, I mean, we know that Magnus is a uh, big desire to win the World Cup, and uh, he's right here at the final. It was his birthday during the tournament, but he's not worried about that. He's worried about facing Magnus Carlsen. He will be doing that today. One person who won't be playing any chess today is Alexandra Garyashkina. She will be resting. She played all the chess that she needed to play in the Women's World Cup Final, which ended yesterday. We look here at uh, the round of 16 bracket and onwards as we observe uh, the incredible run of the Bulgarian young phenom Nurgil Salimova, who would have received an automatic Grandmaster title had she defeated Alexandra Garyachkina in that hotly contested match. The classical portion, both games were drawn in the tiebreaker. Unfortunately for Salimova, she, met, she did lose a slightly worse endgame. And Alexandra Garyachkina, the favorite, crosses the Rubicon and wins the Women's World Cup final. But Nurgul can't get too upset. She makes it into the Women's Candidates Tournament, Peter. We've had some amazing runs in both World Cups this year. For sure. Uh, what uh, Nurgul Salimova has achieved in this tournament, and she had been playing with sensational fighting spirit. This will to fight, the will to succeed, uh, knocking out in this uh, brilliant uh, tiebreak match, uh, Anna Muzichuk on her way to, to reaching the final. Yes, it was very close. In the second classical game, Salimova seemed like a automatic winner because she was like pawn up, better position than it turned out to be. Two pawns up. However, exactly then the situation suddenly turned and it wasn't easy to convert. She got nervous and finally Goryashkina came back and sealed the match in this uh, dramatic tiebreak yesterday. It was dramatic. That's really the only word for it. And the open section has been nothing short of dramatic as well. Let's take a look at the bracket that sent Prague and Magnus Carlsen to the finals. There are so many delicious narratives that we'll be discussing uh, as we go along here with the final, but one of them is the contrasting brackets, the, the contrasting levels of opposition experienced by Magnus Carlsen and Pragnananda. And this is absolutely not a knock on Magnus Carlsen's opposition, which has been stellar. He has faced the legend, Vasily Ivanchuk, not an easy match. Gukesh, I mean, that was a close match as well. Carlsen had to convert an equal endgame with the Black Pieces. Then he faced Nijata Basov, who's having one of the best tournaments, probably the best tournament of his life. But if we look at Prague's bracket, Statistically, Prague's opposition has been 
an order of magnitude greater than Carlson's. Pragas had to defeat his compatriot, Arjun Aragaisi, in a crazy match. Then he faced a very weak player in Fabiano Caruana, and now his reward? Yeah, you get Magnus Carlsen in the final. So, Peter, the level of Prague's opposition really adds an extra component uh, to, to just the amazing quality of his play here in Baku. Yeah, absolutely. He has shown brilliant play, incredible fighting spirit. That's the only way you can succeed in this grueling format. Also, he did mention that, yes, he was he still needs rest days as well it was so nice to hear it from him that yes uh, he's human after all uh, he was really happy to have that uh, yesterday however he had to fight uh, magnus carson having their one uh, rest day upper hand on the other hand they use this energy this determination the will to fight i think will give him all the energy that he needs and by the way we also haven't talked about two players pragnananda has knocked out none other than hikaru nakamura uh on the way to the quarterfinals oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly and also uh magnus carson had this very big match against vincent keimer the only match which was a scare for him ever since he settled in again and plays brilliant chess indeed and it's so easy to forget that this match between carlson and keimer happened in this world cup and there was one move that stood between magnus carlson and his exit from baku that move was knight takes c4 so we often think there's this deterministic component to who's in the final but really there isn't and you know anybody who crosses this many matches has had to go through a lot of scares for Prague it was definitely his match against Arjun Aragaisi that match was something else we're going to be using the word nerves a lot presumably especially if this final goes to tie breaks but there were plenty of nerves to last Prague uh, the entire tournament in his match against Arjun Aragaisi and in his match against Fabiano Caruana. And of course, Fabiano Caruana is not weak. He is an incredible form. And to defeat Fabi in this kind of form is an achievement to hang Prague's hat on. But Peter, he will have to push everything aside. He will have to push his exhaustion aside because to have the most difficult match you've played come at the very end of a tournament like this, that is just brutal. Yes, <laughs> but in order to win the World Cup, <laughs> Yes, uh, kind of. You have to expect that you have to go through hell. And uh, Prague has done that. You mentioned uh, his incredible tiebreak match against Arjun Aragaisi. It was just unbelievable. They both showed a lot of nerves. It, it wasn't, you know, about playing perfect chess. No, not at all. It was the tiebreak. Uh, also, two very good friends. However, this incredible will to fight, uh, to will to succeed from both sides, and finally, at the end of the day, Ragnananda has managed to knock his very good friend Arjun out of the tournament, then knocking out Fabiano Caruana also in a very tough match. Prague himself was saying that, yeah, I was basically in trouble in every single game, uh, which shows, first of all, the incredible class of uh, Fabiano Caruana, mm -hmm. clear, and also the defensive skills of Prague that no matter what kind of pressure is coming against him, no matter what kind of force, he's withstanding it and he's ready to fight against anyone. That's exactly right. It's not like Prague is channeling the games into a certain kind of position. He is showing an incredibly mature universality, uh, a will to win, but at the same time, a cold-bloodedness that we expect from uh, veterans like Fabiano Caruana. And, and there are some amazing stats that our hardworking production team has come up with to make this narrative, uh, to make this matchup even more delicious. It really blows your mind when you think about it. Carlson and Prague, they're both playing their first World Cup final in their career. Prague at 18 years old, having just turned 18 about a week ago, is the youngest World Cup finalist in history. And here's one more stat to keep you up at night. Prague, Carlson was already a grandmaster. He became a GM in 2004 when Prague was born in 2005. So this really is a matchup of the generations, if there ever was one, which just makes us makes it more impressive the way that Prague has reached the finals and, and the poise uh, that he has displayed. It really has been an epic performance, Peter. But 30 seconds to the start of the game, are we going to see a completion of Prague's Cinderella run? It's an incredibly successful performance regardless, but man, would he like that cherry on top. For sure. Uh, I think also one thing is clear that Magnus Carson is... A clear favorite. I mean, no matter against whom Magnus plays, he's the clear favorite. And I believe also that Prague doesn't mind this at all. Let all the pressure be on Magnus's shoulders. 
Yeah, let let me just play my chess. This is what he have he what he has done so far with such incredible inspiration. And there is Magnus Carlsen and the handshake. Classic, classic Magnus. He comes one second before the start of the round. He's got his victuals. Yeah, he's got his hydration, his H two O there. And uh, Pragnananda will have the white pieces in the first game, which puts a special kind of pressure on you. This is a two-game match. In the old days, the World Cup final was four games. And all smiles there from, I think, from only one player. Prague seems sufficiently relaxed. I think he's having a great time. And will he be having a great time in this game? He sticks with 1c4. The ceremonial first move corresponded to Prague's actual choice. Here we go. Yes. Yeah, this be actually should come as a slight surprise to Magnus. Prague has been playing a lot of e4, d4s in the tournament. Yeah, he did play c4 as well. But uh, certainly you wouldn't be thinking about Prague uh, being the biggest maestro of c4. However, he has done it against none other than Hikaru Nakamura. Shows a lot of confidence. He wants to fight. He wants to avoid... Uh, mainstream theories and I also believe that it's nice that Prague gets the white pieces when you are coming from a grueling very nervy tiebreak match then I think it's uh, very important that uh, you get comfort with the white pieces and you are the one who is setting the tone for that first game and we've seen this type of reaction from Magnus Carlsen throughout the tournament he really takes his time on the first move you know he likes to carefully notate all of the game information there's no rush to execute the first response from Magnus. He hasn't experienced too much time pressure throughout the tournament. You can see him there very methodically adjusting his pieces. And you called this kind of mind games from Magnus Carlsen, making his opponent revel in the pressure of waiting for his first move. Will we see E5, the most principled response? Will we see a symmetrical English? Or will Magnus Carlsen stick to a Queen's Gambit decline scheme with E6? I'm expecting the first move to be knight f6. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just uh, simply the most flexible move. You still do not show your cards. You might be able to, after knight cc to switch to e5 if you want. Yes, uh, but it's all about mind games. And Magnus knows very well that he can play any kind of opening. And he also knows that his opponent is going crazy right now. That, okay, <laughs> come on, show me what you're going to play because you know exactly that before in the preparation you had to kind of consider <laughs> like 15, 20 different choices of, of Magnus. Man, this reminds me of that time in school where, where the teacher is about to pass out the tests and something keeps distracting my teacher. It talks about what grades people received and then what the weather is like. Just pass out the test already so I know what I got. And Prague taking a sip of water there. Magnus taking a prolonged period of time, two minutes now. And the question that we always ask, you know, is he actually deciding what to play? I don't think there's any chance of that being the case. Prague has already played C4 this tournament. And there it is, E5 for Magnus Carlsen. Wow, that's a statement. Yes, no uh, finesse with knight f6. Uh, however, after knight c3 from Prague, we might be seeing the move knight f6. I don't believe that Magnus, will he go for bishop b4? It's a little bit too speculative for such an uh, important game, the first game of the World Cup. Yeah, bishop b4 unbalances the position and leads to an immediate confrontation. White often jumps with the knight to d5, much like in the Trumpowski. And knight f6, the safest, the main line by Magnus Carlsen. And of course, a wide choice here for Prague as he develops his other knight, the four knights English. And uh, still, the position very undefined, Peter. Lots of different options for White, who can fianchetto his bishop. He can play this classical style with e3. So too early to make any hard and fast conclusions. Yes. Uh, well, one conclusion I believe we can make that most probably going to see the move knight c6. However, even this, at, at the moment when I wanted to say that, yeah, we are almost certain to see knight c6 then it done to me that uh, lately this gambit with e4, e4. knight g5 mm -hmm. c6 started to appear and honestly objectively it's not even bad it's uh, just a very sound gambit uh, i do believe that uh, Prague has had that position already uh, last year in the champions chess tour i do recall his game against someone I'm, I'm confused. I don't want to uh, say something wrong, but I do believe that uh, we have seen Prague getting experience in that one. I believe that uh, knowing Magnus, that he's a very classical type of player. He likes to play knight c6. 
here, I believe it will be his main choice. I'm proud to call myself one of the first victims of this e4 and c6 gambit with h7, h5, uh, often following when the knight lands on g3. Uh, there's a Norwegian talent named Elham Abdul Rauf. He's now an IM. And he used to play this gambit against me something like three or four years ago, back when it was completely unknown. And I thought I was crazy because I kept getting bad positions. He would play h5. You know, I'd play something like e3. He would play h4. And I felt like the position's really unpleasant. Then I ran it through Stockfish, and it was showing something like a 0.3 advantage for white, which is crazy given that Black has sacrificed a center pawn. So this is not just a gimmicky gambit. This is this is the real deal. And now it's it's sort of entering the mainstream. But I tend to agree. I mean, for Magnus to take such a big risk so early on in the game, well, first of all, it requires Magnus to come back to the board. But second of all, it really isn't his signature. It isn't what we've come to expect from Carlson who likes to slow roll things, especially with the black pieces. Yes, uh, and now I'm also starting to get some memories back that maybe it was even Pragnananda who played it with the black pieces. Was it against Levon Aronian? I mean, I believe the chat already is shouting out all the information. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's a super interesting gambit, but Magnus, Magnus is Magnus, and I'm expecting the classical approach with knight c6. And uh, mystery where Magnus has gone to. Obviously, we, we don't want to speculate too much. It can be an early bathroom trip. It can be a trip for a particular kind of beverage. Maybe he's just uh, getting his steps in. But <laughs> I am starting to get a little bit concerned, Peter. It is only move three. It is a little bit early to get up for three minutes. Yes, certainly. But uh, maybe Magnus also feels like that he hasn't made up his mind which line he will choose. So whether he's sitting at the board and thinking about which direction he should uh, drive the game, or is he just walking around somewhere with a, with a purpose, does not really change too, <laughs> too much. On the other hand, one could give the argument that if he, he would play in the move knight c6, then let's make that move as quickly as possible and then wait for the opponent to determine his option with e3 or g3 and after that you can think again which direction you want to go we will take this opportunity folks to remind you that there's also a third place match going on uh fabi is not out of the tournament and neither uh is magnus carlson's last victim nijat abasov there in the bird's eye view you can see the catalan that is on the board between abasov and carlson and we will obviously focus the majority of our attention on the finals matches carlson finally sits back at the board. But we will, from time to time, check in on the third place match, which obviously determines uh, the next candidates qualifier as well. So that's a big match uh, that we have uh, in case, you know, the Prague-Carlson game ends quickly. And there we have the answer. Uh, the Four Knights English with the Fianchetto, the move G3, is on the board, Peter. Yes, I believe it was to be expected because uh, this is what we have seen already in the... Hikaru match. Uh, Prague has already played G3. We were kind of surprised that Hikaru opted for the move knight d4. I believe, yeah, which uh, should have come as a surprise, but it wasn't a surprise to Prague. One could have argued that the move d5, which is the most classical approach, c takes d5, knight d5, the favorite of Hikaru Nakamura, was the one that Prague most probably had really prepared. Now the big question is, uh, after bishop g2, Hikaru has been playing the classical knight b6, short castles, bishop e7 line. However, I do somehow sense that Magnus is the type of guy who would go for the fashionable bishop c5, which also has a rock solid reputation if we about to witness this position. Mm -hmm. So the bishop comes out to a more ambitious developing square. Uh, there's knight takes e5 related tactics, which always scare me, but. It's way too early for that. Here, does the line generally go castles and then black castles as well? Um, how does black develop his pieces in that bishop c5 variation? Yes, let me get back to that position. <laughs> Sorry to make you re-enter the moves. No, no, it's uh, it's fine. Yeah, after bishop c5, we did see, I think, in the, during that uh, crazy tie break between Wang Hao and... Uh, uh -huh. Rasmus Vane, this uh, surprising move, queen c2, which was met by knight db4, queen b1, knight d4. 
Uh, yes, we have seen that. By the way, D5 had been already played by Magnus. We might oh. be heading. Yes, we might be. It, it wasn't something like a big sensation that I was able to guess this D5 move since Prague has been playing the move Bishop B4 in the tournament. You feel like you don't want to be in your opponent's territory. And uh, Magnus seemingly also deciding a little bit over the board which uh, setup he chooses. Clearly, he wants to avoid uh, Prague's main setup. Indeed. So we have the more mainstream D5 contrasted with Ikaru Nakamura's night jump to D4 and the players executing the nearly forced continuations, Prague and Kettoing his bishop. And now we've got the next big choice for Magnus Carlsen. Will he opt for the fashionable bishop C5 or will he choose the more traditional setup with the bishop uh, developing more modestly and the knight dropping back to B6? Yes, all lies on Magnus. I believe he will make up his mind pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I believe it's, it's, it will be bishop c5. That's my, my guess. It looks like Magnus is about to move. He's sort of holding his pen, which is, in my experience, a sign that a hand that's about to hold the pen is about to be holding a piece. But not quite yet. <laughs> Hard to get a read on Magnus's body language. He simultaneously seems like ultra relaxed, Almost like this is a casual training game. Just the way that he's moving his pieces. And the knight comes back, not to b6, Peter, but to wow. f6. Okay. Yes. Very interesting. This move does exist. It has a very solid reputation. Uh, mm -hmm. But it never got really mainstream. It, it never... Uh, one could... The, the move when I saw this uh, knight f6 for the first time was something like this, that in this bishop c5 line, after queen c2, black has this move knight db4 or knight falling back to f6. One could argue, however, that the bishop c5, queen c2 moves might be in black's favor here, that he managed to develop the bishop. Uh, Magnus immediately dropping back that knight to f6 gives us the feeling that he just wants to get out of the preparation of his opponent. Yeah, this is a mm -hmm. very rare move. I'm pretty sure that uh, he has the feeling that Prague might have seen the move, but since there is so much to work on and there are so much problems in opening theory, you, you can't devote all your time to every single move. And uh, probably Prague has to play on his own right here from right uh, now. Knight f6, I'm seeing over 300 games in my database. Here's an interesting fact. Magnus Carlsen face this move, but Magnus was white. This was against Jordan Van Forest uh, exactly a year ago at the Zagreb uh, GCT Rapid. And Magnus has played this move also with Black, but a while ago, 2020, he played it against Jan Nepomnishi, and he played it against Digny Ren. Both were online Rapid games during peak COVID. So in Prognanada's preparation, he might have assigned, I mean, typically you assign slightly less weight uh, to moves that are played, in, in online tournaments and in the rapid time control. So Carlson has played this before. Hikaru Nakamura has played this before in 2022. And at first was played in 1937. So again, this is not a novelty. This is not a strange move. And Magnus has played it before. But you cannot predict everything. And Peter, likely this was on Prague's radar. But did he spend a lot of time on it before? Okay, two games in the database. Carlson played this against Jan. Yes, and it's also the first line of engine. Uh, that's how, you know, the top players are working. Yeah, you have the engine running, you check the moves, and even if there are some lines which you haven't studied very deeply, you still have, you know, all these impulses that the computer was showing. Yeah, you, you definitely have seen the top three lines of the engine. Uh, you are familiar with the big question that how deep is the preparation? Mm hmm and also how black reacts. Uh, will black go for direct confrontation with e4, which I guess is going to be met by knight g5. Without computer lines, I believe it's uh, kind of difficult to understand exactly what's going on. Black will capture the b4 pawn, white will capture the e4 pawn. Usually a center pawn is more important, but black gets uh, quick development. And there is another completely different type of reaction, just making the move a7, a6. 
Mm -hmm. uh, saying that, you know what? Yes, B4 was fantastic. B4 was beautiful. Let's just quickly also use the uh, chance to show why Bishop takes B4 isn't a great idea. Then White plays the typical knight sacrifice, knight takes E5. And after knight takes E5, there is queen A4 check. And after knight C6, bishop takes C6 check, B takes C6. White collects the piece, has the better pawn structure, and has the bigger, uh, has a stable clear advantage. So after the move B4, there is an argument to be made that, okay, I don't want to be provoked. Let me just play A6. I guess that one of the main setups of knight F6 is placing the bishop to D6. But I also feel like I shouldn't be talking too much because the players are exactly uh, reacting the opposite to what I'm saying. Well, Carlson, he definitely remembers his game against Nepo because it was quite recently. Yes, this was an online event. Carlson played a6 in that game. And there's the deviation. Here he immediately develops his bishop to d6, which tells us he's not afraid of the subsequent advance of the pawn to b5. But b5 would definitely be the way, uh, the, the most principled response. And my guess is that Carlson is preparing to make the knight jump to d4. b5 is met with knight d4. And in general, that knight should not be touched. If you trade on d4, then black institutes that clamp in the center with the d4 pawn. So you often see white kind of playing around the knight uh, with moves like queen to a4, putting pressure laterally. You could also castle and ignore the knight entirely. Of course, you could play e3 and force the knight to commit either backward to e6 or trading on f3. But that does weaken uh, the light squares in the center. So this is really not a move you play unless you're desperate to get the knight out of d4. Yes, uh, b5, knight d4, queen a4 kind of uh, inviting black to capture on f3 or... To, the, to bring the knight back to e6. Somehow I feel like knight takes f3, bishop takes f3, and then going for castles, eventually breaking the queen side with a6. Also very thematic that usually black wants to play a6, h6 kind of moves with the knight on f6. A very solid line. On the other hand, white, thanks to this lovely bishop on f3, can hope to exert some pressure against the b7 pawn, making uh, Black's bishop from c8 difficult to develop. Yeah, visually, and you know, I'm obviously uh, have a pretty untrained eye in these positions. I like White's position. That bishop, as you said, pressuring b7. When White advances the pawn to b5, that's usually a positive for White because it does really restrict the mobility of Black's pawn structure on the queen side. But obviously, we're jumping the gun here. Knight d4 is not forced. You could play knight e7, but that just seems to contrast with. Magnus Carlsen's opening strategy here, he has provoked the move b5. And generally, when you provoke a move, uh, you jump forward. You don't, you know, passively retreat. After knight e7, you know, white can support the pawn with a4. That's not really an option for someone as principled as Magnus. And he spends no extra time here. The knight jumps out to d4. And now the next big decision for Prague, queen a4 is tempting, but it's obviously not forced. Prague could also castle and complete his kingside development. I feel that if uh, Prague will play the move Queen A4 in like uh, one, two minutes, it will be a clear signal that he's still very much in his preparation. Uh, mm -hmm. Simply for the fact that Queen A4 is a move when you know that the computer says Queen A4. Otherwise, you are not that sure that should I move the Queen already so quickly to A4? Should I maybe first castle? Mm -hmm. Eventually, also one could argue that, yeah, white wants to play the move a4 so the queen steps in the way of uh, this pawn but here the factor that the knight on d4 should not really be tolerated for too long so uh, that's the argument i think that's the main idea behind queen a4 to make black decide as quickly as possible on the fate of the knight on d4 before black is able to eventually reinforce it yeah, and that knight on d4, in and of itself, it's not such a big problem, but it is sort of a foreign body uh, among white's pieces. And the pressure can be increased to the move bishop to g4. And then uh, the concrete positional threats start to appear. If black plays bishop g4, then black would be threatening bishop takes f3. And you called it, Peter Prague played queen a4 in exactly a minute. And that tells us he is still within his opening preparation. And I really think the opening so far is turning out positively for Prague. But 
again, it's still too early to say the players haven't completed their development and we should wait, you know, two or three moves before we make any hard and fast conclusions. Yes, uh, basically the reason why we are very happy with Plak's uh, opening is that he definitely got a playable position. He got a position where, first of all, also Magnus' uh, experience doesn't uh, make such a huge impact because this is a very, very fresh position, a very new position. I don't believe that you can just rely on your uh, experience. What kind of experience do you have here? Yes, the experience would tell you that, okay, if we trade on F3, takes, takes, let's just make this move castles, castles. If I'm able to break uh, this construction with B5 with a timely A6, that's fantastic uh, for black, but that is still the problem, the issue that the rook is pinned, so A takes B5 isn't a threat. And the bishop cannot really develop to d7 because then the b7 pawn hangs. So white can just follow it up with, with d3, eventually also threatening a strategical idea with bishop g5. That's why black would also make the moves h6. There is something to play with for white, and I believe that uh, Prague's fans, and there are tons out there, uh, should be quite happy that he got a nice playable position. And obviously a huge shout out to uh, Prague's fans in India, but also across the world. Uh, the support that he gets at home, uh, both on the board, but also off the board, has really propelled uh, the, the young talents in India, which include Gukesh and Aragaisi, who also had excellent World Cup performances, to uh, the status that they have acquired uh, and to what will certainly be long, exciting and illustrious chess careers. And we might be looking back, you know, 20 years later and saying this is really the event. Uh, that started Prague's run uh, potentially toward being a world title contender. But all of it has to start uh, with outplaying Magnus Carlsen from this complicated middle game. And Magnus is not taking on F3 immediately. Why, you might ask? Well, he's not considering the pawn sack on D4. That would be a disaster. He is considering the move knight D4 back to E6. And what excites me about that move is the fact that the knight can reroute potentially to C5 and knock that queen out of A4, which can set in motion you know, that process of black going a6 and chipping away at white's uh, advantage on the queen side. So it deserves attention. Knight e6 should not just be cast away. For sure, yes. Uh, knight e6 is a very principled move. You can also somehow feel like if you take on f3, you are playing into your opponent's hand. Uh, okay, if, for example, you know that, yes, uh, it looks good for white, but actually it's nothing, or you completely believe about that fact, then... There is no issue taking on FC, but if you are not that sure, then the move 96 mm -hmm. is uh, actually very interesting. It keeps more tension in the game. On the other hand, it's also more risky because uh, we talked about the benefits of kicking that queen away. However, we also should be, for example, talking about the possibilities for white. So after moves like castles, castles, there is an option of breaking the center with D2, D4. There is also the possibility of first developing the bishop to b2 and later go for this d4 break. Very delicate questions, hard to mm -hmm. immediately get an answer to all of this. Yeah, and we'd get completely different positions if Prague plays d3 versus d4. And let me ask you this as sort of a side question. Is part of Magnus's consideration uh, his desire to escape Prague's file? Is he actively thinking, okay, between these two moves, which one of them is likelier to lead Prague out of his preparation? Or is the position sufficiently stable to where Magnus isn't really worried about that anymore? Well, I have the feeling that Magnus opted for the move knight f6. Let me even just get back here to knight f6. With the main purpose of surprising Prague. However, the surprise, in a sense, backfired that no, Prague is not surprised at all. He is very familiar with the position. He knows the computer lines. He has studied the position. And then the question is, uh, how much Magnus decided on this knight f6 over the board? Yeah, that he knew that, okay, this is a solid option. Yes, uh, I don't know all the details, but it's, uh, it's a strategic position. So it's not about move pen move lines. And Magnus usually does not afraid such positions, relying on his incredible skills. Uh, but when you are facing someone who is confidently blitzing out his preparation, 
then suddenly you can start to question also your decision that yes maybe i shouldn't have played knight f6 why did i do that uh, we don't know what's going on in magnus's mind i'm just speculating that it might also not be so easy enough for magnus to make up his mind and these feelings are universal no matter if you're magnus or you're playing your first over the board tournament i've been through that so many times where you're sitting there and uh, you're starting to get those pangs of regret. You know, I could have just played what I know best. You know, why did I try to outsmart my opponent? I ended up outsmarting myself. And when those second thoughts start to creep in, that's when you realize that you don't really like your position. Now, again, not saying that Magnus is having those second thoughts, but he hasn't moved in a while now. And I'm liking Prague's position objectively. There's no question that he's got maybe a very modest, but, but still an edge according to the engine in a position that he's likely analyzed and explored, not just move by move, but also in terms of the ideas, right? After knight takes f3, bishop takes f3, you know, if he spent an hour or two on that resulting position, he might know certain subtleties that can allow him to play the resulting middle game well. What are those subtleties? Well, whether he goes d3 or d4. Where does the bishop on c1 develop? You know, do you usually put it on e3 or do you put it on g5? When do you drop the queen back from a4? So when high-level players prepare... They're not just pressing the space bar and entering moves into their file. They're also analyzing the resulting middle games, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, and putting an emphasis on the ideas that allow them to successfully transition, particularly in lines that are a little bit less theoretical and more based on, let's call it, strategic understanding. Yes, I think you made very good points. That's exactly how the top players operate. Yeah, that you know exactly that strategically speaking, you understand the position. So the, the big question is you want to make a couple of natural moves and to understand where the game will go after the natural. You, you don't necessarily look at all of the computer options. It's it just uh, not necessary. Also, you don't have time to do that in every single position. I, I think that one of the main questions, yeah, if we would be talking about this position like castles, castles, uh -huh. if black does not want to play a6, then a move like rook e8 could be played, white plays d3, h6, and then the question comes that, yes, what happens next? Then white develops the bishop to e3, or should we play bishop b2? When does this queen move from a4? Or what you already described. Yeah, and that's a pretty big choice, right? Each individual move might not seem like a big deal. Okay, does it really impact the game where the bishop goes? The answer is yes. Right? That's maybe a rhetorical question, but the answer isn't what some people might expect. At this level, every developing move, every one of these subtleties actually is potentially game deciding, especially when you take them together, right? Maybe you move the queen back prematurely. What happens? Well, you allow black to play a6 and free himself from the shackles of white's b5 pawn bang that changes the position entirely uh so you know these aren't just obscure positional decisions they are super important but if we get this position i think we're likely to see bishop e3 and uh i think we will be likely to see the move a7 a6 i i wouldn't personally be able to live with that b5 pawn forever yes that's for sure but the problem is that <laughs> after a6 we are still not getting rid of that uh, pawn on b5 if, if black yeah. would get rid of <laughs> yes if black gets rid of that i believe that okay black is just very solid yes white might have a very tiny little initiative but the black shouldn't be, be worried but the fact that we are unable to develop that bishop and there is this pin here and there's another pin here and it drives us crazy that we are unable to take a takes b5. That's the reason why Magnus Carlsen after queen a4 is still pondering about his next move. Uh, because it's somehow irritating. It, it feels mm -hmm. like there should be kind of an easy solution. Look at this Magnus on his chair also moving a little bit back and forth, trying to convince himself which direction he should be heading. Now let's unspool the tape here a little bit. And, and ask, uh, just to clarify, it, are knight takes f3 and knight e6 the only candidate moves? The other, even hypothetically, the only other move that comes to my mind is c7, c5. It's a pretty brazen move, but I think it makes sense <clears throat> intuitively to, to try to support that knight. Of course, the big problem is that white can take on Passant, and white will take on Passant. Now black has to recapture with the knight, and this opens up an entire new theater of action for white on the queen side. You've gotten rid of the pawn. But the, you know, medicine is worse than the disease because now that b5 square can be used not by the pawn, but by the knight. White can jump in there with the knight 
And suddenly black experiences, you know, massive tactical issues. If black castles here, you lose the exchange. White takes on d6 and follows up with bishop a3 uh, as, you're, as you're showing on the board. So that's not possible. If black moves the bishop to e7, I think there might even be a shot on e5 here. If I'm looking at this correctly, knight takes e5, knight takes e5, and, you know, probably the primitive knight c7 and knight takes a8 is good enough. White just wins the exchange and queen takes a7 is threatened. So that's out of the question too. I think it's pretty clear, Peter, that realistically there are two candidate moves here uh, that Magnus is choosing between. Yes, uh, the move c5 is strategically very risky, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. it, it can only uh, work in combination of very quick development. Yeah, if black is able and Magnus has decided on capturing on f3, the most natural move, it will be super interesting to see how he will solve that issue that we have been talking about this look on a8, bishop on c8, and that eventually after the desired a7, a6, still not so easy to get rid of that uh, monster pawn on b5. Because white's bishop will leave its shell on g2, that does yield black the extra resource of bishop c8 to h3 in some positions. But often white will meet that move as we see Prague, of course, recapturing on f3 with the bishop, with bishop takes b7, creating a situation where both rooks are hanging. And the tactics, you know, th there is a line that keeps sticking in my mind, which is like bishop takes f1, bishop takes a, queen takes a8. And if you play king takes f1, you get checkmated on h3. So if we can show that line really quickly, bishop h3. Now, I think that white should consider moving the rook. But after bishop takes b7, bishop takes f1, interestingly enough, uh, you want to play king takes f1 and positionally sacrifice the exchange. White is better in this position because he will earn himself a second pawn uh, with queen takes a7 or just drop the bishop back and, and surround that pawn. But if we could just show that line, it's it's a cute pattern with uh, bishop takes a8. Uh, the greedy move gets punished rather severely. Queen takes a8. You can see the eval bar there dropping off a cliff. And uh, white's king will want to fall off a cliff after queen h1 because it will get <laughs> checkmated. So that should be avoided. Something tells me Prague is aware of this variation. <laughs> yes. I also uh, have the feeling uh, bishop takes f3, short castle on the board. Uh -huh. I do believe that, yes, uh, Prague will maybe spend a little time just to make sure that uh, calculating these lines like short castle, bishop h3, uh, convincing himself that, yes, <laughs> basically this action sacrifice is not a sacrifice, it's a dream scenario for white. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's clear that only white can be better there. You shouldn't be Going after the material, it's much more to, to keep the light squares under control. But on the other hand, there is also an alternative like first he can maybe make the move D to D3, waiting for black to show his cards. But uh, somehow, if you don't worry about bishop H3, then clearly castle is the most natural move. Yeah, it definitely is. But Prague has kept himself with almost all of the time that he started with. And uh, as he ponders his next move, we have such an exciting start to the 2023 World Cup final on both of our boards. We've got Nijada Basov, who is playing his usual brand of enterprising chess. What started out as a Catalan is almost unrecognizable. There's an open G file. Uh, there's a massive center. And we will have a quick look at Abasov Caruana. But first, uh, as the camera pans out to Fabiano, uh, who tries to secure a third place finish, we will take our first break of the day. Such exciting action here at the 2023 World Cup. You will not want to go anywhere. We will come back with action from both of our games on the other side of this short break. Interested in becoming a chess streamer like your favorite creators, such as Hikaru, Gotham Chess, and the Botan Sisters? Come on! Look at this! Woo! The Chess.com Community Streamer Program is growing every day. Whether you're just getting started with streaming or already established and looking to expand your audience, you can now connect your account to Chess.com and have your stream promoted on the game's largest platform. Simply link your account at Chess.com slash settings slash connected accounts, set your category to Chess on Twitch, and start streaming. You'll get an ad-free experience on Chess.com. You will pop up on our list of live streamers. Your Chess.com profile will feature your Twitch stream. 
and your stream will be linked to your games on our play server. Type Command Community Streamer in chat and start growing your stream today. But she's not going to move it because it's defended. Oh, <gasps> she did it! <laughs> I just you said don't, Levy. I just said don't go there! <gasps> we need a compilation. Chess.com social media crew, look through the Pac Champs oh, games. Oh, baby! Let's and go! Find how many times I called the move Let's before go. it happened. I mean, <laughs> okay, Levy, you asked for it. Here we go. It's almost a Jarvis stalemate. Jarvis knows what he's doing. He's gonna oh, try to force Andrea, it. Andrea, there's a stalemate coming. Pawn here, take King G4. He pushes and it's a stalemate. Oh my goodness. Well, you, you clearly, you, I'm sure you taught Frank about stalemate. Oh. No. Okay, just no! don't push. This, I blame you for all of this. <laughs> this is oh your manifestation. Goodness. Oh my See? goodness. Bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes, loses the bishop. And if that happens, I will be heartbroken because you could have just... That was your heart, I mean. Is it feeling okay? Your heart? How is it? You, you can't even script this stuff, my man. Again, <laughs> they just forgot. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> His position is is hard to lose as long as it stays how it is. Yeah, for sure. Unless he starts going totally crazy with something like pawn to G. <laughs> what is your ability today? You literally said that in real time. And we are back in Baku, the first match game of the finals, as well as the third place match. Live from Baku, this is the 2023 World Cup final. 38 minutes are in the books, and we've already got a lot of action on both of our boards. We've been focusing on uh, the championship match between Carlson and Pragnananda, but there is also a third place match between Nijata Basov, the local hometown hero who's had the performance of his life. And Fabiana Caruana, who has similarly shown tremendous form, but was stopped at the hands of Pragnananda in their rapid tiebreaker. Prague is still pondering uh, the move that we were talking about before the break, whether he castles or plays d3. So let's take this opportunity uh, to swing by the Abbas of Caruana game really quickly, because we've got a very exciting position, uh, Peter. If we unspool the, the tape here, we started out as a Catalan, but looking at this position, I think the only clue that this is a Catalan maybe is the fact that White's Bishop was once Fianchetto, but this looks, you know, not very Catalanish, shall we say. Yes, uh, I believe in order to make sure that we understand what happened so far, we have to track back, go to the start. Yes, this is a very fashionable main classical Catalan position. Castles, castles, D takes C4, Queen C2. A6, this very line has been featured 
in the game pregnant against Fabiano Caruana in the semifinals already. Bishop d7, queen takes e4, bishop c6. And here comes the deviation. There are two main moves in the position. Bishop f and bishop g5 played by Abbasov. Uh, bishop g5 used to be the old classical move. And knight bd7, it's a relatively fresh development. I do remember like some 15, 20 years ago, uh, people were debating moves like h6, bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, followed by, so then giving up the bishop on f3, going for this opposite colored uh, type of positions, had the reputation of being very lowish, then white find, thanks to computers, some ideas to put some pressure on black. And since Kramnik, I believe it was Vladimir Kramnik, the great Catalan expert, uh, introduced the knight d7 line and he kept on insisting then everybody started to follow knight c3 h6 and there is a slight surprise here one could argue that once the bishop is developed to g5 white most probably trades it on f6 however abasov comes up with a different plan he retreats that bishop to f4 now fabi plays exactly in the same spirit like against pragnanda with bishop d6 it's a typical idea of trading the dark square bishops but the next couple of moves will highlight that Avasov has a very specific idea in mind why he does what he does. If it hits with the queen to this, he fights for the e4 square, so white is basically ready to push e4. Fabi captures an f4, g takes f4, plays the move a5, which is thematic. You want to make sure that the b4 pawn, uh, I mean the b4 square is uh, under control. Otherwise, also white would be starting to go b2, b4 with total control mm -hmm. on all sides of the board. So a5 is played, and here comes actually a very instructive point. White follows it up with king h1, and the whole idea in White's uh, play is based on the fact that White has provoked the seemingly tempo move for black, h7, h6, but in this structure with the, the, with the g file getting opened up, it would be so much more desirable for black to have the pawn on h7 and go g6 with the pawn on h7. Then black would have nothing to worry about long term. But this is the long term pressure. This is exactly what Abasov is building his play on. Bishop takes f3 is uh, typical. You have to trade that bishop. Bishop takes f3, c6, rook g1, king h8, e4, queen e7, and we are at the current position. Wow, that's such an insightful point about the pawn being on h6. So now any time white attacks g7, that's going to be a lot more problematic. Black can still play g6. I mean, we might still see that move, but as a result, the h6 pawn is going to be dreadfully weak. I mean, first impressions are very positive here for Abbasov. Does he keep expanding, Peter, with the move e5? If I'm playing a blitz or a bullet game, I'm saying let's, let's uh, you know, freaking go. Let's go e5 and f5. But obviously, that's a very committal move to play in a classical game because you are giving up uh, the d5 square, but I don't know if I'd be able to resist the temptation. Maybe Abbasov shouldn't resist the temptation. Yes, in order to understand why we are attracted to it, let's make a couple of moves. So e5, the most natural response would be knight d5. The reason why we are so happy and excited about e5 that the move knight d5, which most of the cases is the right reaction, is in fact kind of dubious. White can even decide, do I capture with the knight? Do I capture with the bishop? In any mm -hmm. case, white will follow it up with f4, f5, and gets a very nice initiative. Black's knight on d7 is kind of doomed. If the knight would be on c6, then of course a trade on d5 wouldn't be such a big problem. Then there would be counterplay against the pawn on d4. But like this, it's a very one-sided affair. For sure. And that means the knight has to drop back to a far inferior accommodation. Uh, G8, probably, or, or even H7. Ugh. And then White can play F5 anyway and blast through the gates in the center. I really think that we are likely to see this move. This is very much Apni Jadabasov's alley. This is what he was dreaming of when he played that move King H1. Yes, everything works to perfection. I somehow even feel that the move Queen D8 to E7 was a very unfortunate move. Uh, but maybe Fabi also felt like, okay, what to do? Uh, White has a very clear plan. And uh, there was one very interesting suggestion by the computer to go knight c5 using the fact that there is a pin. It's clear that knight c5 would have been met by queen e3. 
and then the knight falls back to a6, heads toward the b4 square, the weak square. Uh, however, probably Fabi felt like, yes, I might get some stability, but who knows if I have time uh, to make sure that that knight comes into play uh, fast enough, because there might be some kind of uh, direct idea against Black's king. In any case, Fabi opted for queen e7, and now we are very much expecting the energetic e5. We are indeed. A great start to the game for Nijada Basov. That's been consistent with how he's handled a lot of the openings in this tournament. And I think this probably gives us a good chance to segue back to our marquee matchup, our, our championship final between Prague and Magnus, because we have a couple of moves in that game, and we are going entirely as predicted. We have... Uh, on the board, a position that we reached in our analysis, Carlson not delaying a second more than he has to. Um, as we pan out here to Prague against Magnus, he has played the move a6, and we have this tension on the queen side that we were describing, and Prague is likely to ignore that tension and continue with his development scheme with the move d3. Although, Peter, obviously you should pay some attention to a move like bishop to b2, or maybe even bishop to a3, uh, which looks weird, but you know, maybe trading the dark squared bishops is the right approach here. Yes, many tempting options. Uh, clearly, white has to watch out, not that black with a timely bishop h3 jump will solve the problems. That's, uh, I believe, the main question for white. If you know that you have bishop h3 under control and black is unable to resolve that tension, what we already described before on the rook on a8 and this bishop on f3 is hitting b7, then you believe that you can play slowly. Uh, there is also clearly this idea of going bishop a3, certainly a very interesting move, but uh, I don't see any uh, drawbacks of just continuing the most natural way with d3. That's, that's the reason why I'm not looking for the real alternatives at this moment. And after d3, we were earlier analyzing the response h6, so I guess my question would be, what is White's next move here? Let's say Black plays something neutral like Rook E8, which I think is pretty unlikely because this is not such a tempting, improving move. Is White going to emphasize Bishop G5 here? Black can play H6, but then uh, you have to reckon with Bishop F6, Queen F6. The Rook on E8 is now undefended, so my neutral move probably turned out to be harmful. But B takes A6 apparently isn't as good as it appears is it because of c6? Oh, that's a cool line, actually. B takes a6, yes. c6, and a takes b7 looks tempting, but both promotion squares are covered. The b8 square by the bishop that was opened up by black's previous move, and the rook guards the bishop. So tactically, this works out for black, but white is under no obligation to opt for this line. Uh, even bishop g5 is not forced, and white has plenty of helpful moves in the bank, like rook b1. Yeah, we're thinking on the same page. It just seems like white has more helpful semi-waiting moves than black does. And that's part of the reason that this looks like a pretty unpleasant position for Magnus. Yes, uh, I believe that uh, no human would allow bishop g5. It's just mm -hmm. completely, completely crazy to do that. Yeah, One has the argument that it's a quite slow position, so it doesn't really bring me any benefit of not getting rid of the threat of bishop g5. Yeah? So, uh, making sure that after this, I'm going to play h6, I'm tossing the move to white. White will most probably play something like rook b1 or develop the bishop from c1. But if the bishop is not going to g5, then any of this developing move does not scare me from the black side. Yeah, It feels like, okay, it's going to be a slow move and I'm going to take it from there. It's, uh, it's only the fact that uh, what we are talking about all the time uh, we believe that white has certain initiative mm -hmm. and the move has been played. D3, yes. Yep, D3 is on the board and Magnus's response is instant and it is H6. Yes. Great call. Yeah, Bishop G5, definitely not a move that uh, Black wants to allow unless he's got a death wish. And uh, now big decision for Prague, right? He's made... You know, the, the obvious moves, D3 and castles. And now he's got to make a more substantive decision uh, about where to develop the bishop. Or he can kick the can down the road and, and play rook to B1, which I really like. I think that puts indirect pressure on the B7 pawn. And 
it tosses the ball back to Black's court. We get this interesting cat and mouse game that I was talking about earlier where both sides are kind of skirting around the tension and trying to make helpful improving moves so that they're better prepared once the position does open up and get more tactical. Yes, and while we are discussing the finesse, the computer is thinking, and the computer, as always, comes up with a very interesting, very intelligent way to solve Black's main problem, what we have been discussed, that how on earth will Black get rid of this problem on the B7 pawn? We already kind of sense that rook 8 is not a move. I mean, this rook 8 doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. The idea of going e5, e4 is out of question because white has the e4 square perfectly under control. The, the idea that computer mentions is very instructive. Like after a move like rook b1, he wants to develop the queen to e7, making sure that black gets a connection between his rooks. And finally, after queen e7, he might have the idea of going bishop d7 because bishop d7 was always met by bishop takes b7. However, finally, with the rook protecting from f8 the a8 rook, there will be the idea of a takes b5, solving the problems in a tactical manner. Yes, then white could give up the queen for two rooks, and one could argue that that position is unclear, but I believe that unclear is more in favor of black, because otherwise he's just simply under pressure. Any position which is like dynamic equality, that should be kind of nice for black to go for. And if queen e7 does allow this move b6, but that could be effectively met by c6, and that would blunt uh, white's light squared bishop. It would completely reduce the influence of all of white's queen side pieces. So strategically, b6 is, I think, way, way, way too committal. Uh, so in this situation, Prague would probably develop his bishop. Magnus would play bishop d7. And uh, white can drop the queen back to c2 and just say, okay, you dealt with the first wave of the attack, but now the pawn on b7 actually is hanging, and it's not all that easy to protect that pawn, because if you play the straightforward rook a to b8, well, then obviously uh, you're allowing b takes a6. And if white can introduce a permanent damage uh, to black's queenside pawns, I think Prague will be happier than ever. So here Carlson would probably take on b5, and after knight takes b5, does he have to give up his bishop pair and play c6? Well, then again, white's advantage turns from dynamic into something more static, something more long-term. And, uh, you know, Carlson might have to try to solve his problems tactically in this position, but that's easier said than done. Yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I see the computer oh lines. Oh, my God. Yeah. Come <laughs> <Yes>. on. <laughs> oh, jeez. E5, E4, just sacrificing the pawn. Yes. Uh, once you see it, you can start appreciating it. Uh, however, does it cross your mind? Nope. <laughs> Do you come up with this idea? Definitely no, because white is in total control of the e4 square, d takes e4, and it's not like black immediately gets something for it, then the computer just chills and continues with the move bishop d7 to c6. It's an ultra smart way of playing, even though seeing the moves, I'm still not really understanding why I'm not able to, for example, knight come c3. back with the knight to yeah, c3. I I'm yes. almost afraid to ask, Peter. I mean, knight c3, knight d5 is so natural. And here, Okay, simply rook f8. I mean, I'm still well, not understanding. Okay, knight d rook f8. What if knight d5? And suddenly yes. black is like better. Your queen e6. I mean, come on, just leaving wow. the knight on d5 yes. like that, man. I mean, this is a great illustration of why you cannot just stare at the engine line. And well, how could Magnus not see that? I mean, this is a line five moves deep. No, this is completely unrealistic. Yes, uh, it's basically 3,600 level. That's yeah. uh, that. That's what I'm guessing. Still, it's possible we wouldn't be ruling it out, but no. uh, it's certainly, <laughs> uh, certainly very tough on anyone. Yeah, we can't rule anything out when it comes to Magnus because you know I'm just remembering that stretch against Vasily Ivanchuk when he deployed his rook, and you know he just sometimes gives us six engine moves in a row and wins the game. So uh, we can't rule anything out. Uh, when it comes to Magnus Carlsen, but this is a good sign for Prague. If this is the only way that Black can avoid a long-term advantage from White, well, I mean, fasten your seatbelts, folks, because this this has been a very positive opening for Prague, who is taking his time, right? He's spent quite a bit of time on the last two moves, and it's an important decision, you know, where to put his bishop. It might seem very obvious to play rook b1 now that we're analyzing, but again, put yourself in Prague's shoes. He's facing Magnus. He wants to squeeze the most out of this opening, and you never know which decision is going to end up being critical. So it makes sense to me that he's spending his time here. 
Absolutely. It's a very well invested time. He also feels that the position, first of all, gives chances for White to fight for an advantage. That's already great news. Secondly, the position also has the tendency to eventually uh, being simplified. It's, it's not that ultra rich position where you know exactly that it will be very difficult to, to, to start playing faster, to speed up because every situation will be very critical. If White makes up his mind and feels that, aha, I came up uh, with a plan that I believe it's, it's nice, I know my direction, then White will be able to make the next couple of moves uh, rather quickly. That's why feeling the momentum, feeling that this is a critical moment and uh, making sure that you understand everything what you want to do, you also should not be only looking what I can do. You have to be searching for the opponent's ideas and Prague has to see queen e7, bishop d7 idea in order to already make sure that he's comfortable with this and he will also know his answer to that. For sure. And I think rook b1 would be sort of a Prague 2.0 kind of move, right? If you look at Prague a year ago or two years ago, incredible talent. You know, his calculation was always at, at a very high level, but sometimes he struggled in these slower positions sometimes struggle to make the non-forcing move, uh, the move that would toss the ball back into his opponent's court. And, you know, the Prague that we've been seeing in this tournament, we talked about it at the start of the show, is someone who is almost equally comfortable uh, in slower positions and equally comfortable in technical positions, as he showed uh, with that flawless conversion of an extra piece against Ikaro. So this is part of the growth of a chess player. Can you handle a position that maybe a year ago uh, would have presented a lot of difficulties. So a big test for Prague in these next couple of moves. Yes, this is what we call becoming universal. Yeah, And in order to become top 10 player, and we, we are talking about this, that once you look at the games of Prague, one gets the impression that he's like a top 10 player already. Yes. And, it, and it's exactly for this fact that this universality, that no matter what kind of uh, position he's going, for he feels comfortable. He also has the opening weapons already, the knowledge to be able to play C4, D4, E4. Now suddenly asking some questions to Magnus Carlsen and I very much see uh, Prague now employing the strategy that usually Magnus does to his opponents that you are unable to guess which direction he will uh, drive the game. And now suddenly Magnus Carlsen is the one who has to be careful with the black piece against Prague. For sure. And of course, there's, you know, personal touch as I watch these games. Uh, two years ago, I was invited randomly to the uh, 2021 US Championship uh, as a wild card. And I had a month to prepare. And, uh, you know, it was like my house is falling apart. You have a month to build up a mansion. Uh, and, and one of the things I did was have a couple of training sessions with uh, Ramesh, uh, the all-star Indian trainer, and a couple of sessions with Prague. And it really struck me you know, not only his work ethic as Bishop A3 is played on the board, and we'll get to the move in a second, but uh, just, you know, his ability to spend the entire day on chess. I'd be exhausted after a two-hour session of calculation, and I'd ask Prague, what are you doing now? Resting, nap? Nope. He's going on to the next session where he's going to work on a completely different aspect of chess. So this is, you know, the skill set of a 2,700 player. This is the drive uh, of a super GM, and uh, we see two years later uh, what Prague is becoming and what is this position becoming, Peter? Bishop a3? I mentioned this move, but it still is a bit of a surprise to me. What's going on here? To me, it actually signals that Prague has foreseen the idea of what Computer mentioned with Queen e7, Bishop d7. I, I don't believe that the players need to go into very big depths. Yeah, it's just very important. Humanly, the question was that will Black be able to solve this problem of developing the bishop, the pressure against the b7 pawn? How does he do that? And the move queen e7 connecting the rooks was key. And with the move bishop a3, uh, Prague kind of signals that, that yes, if I just keep the position, then I won't be able to hinder your development. And you are already clearly eyeing for the queen e7, bishop d7 plan. So let me sidestep and ask new questions. Um, you, you did mention the move bishop a3, I believe, with the pawn on d2 mm -hmm. and black's pawn on h7, being a perfectly justified alternative. And then why isn't d3, h6, maybe even something that white should be even happy about, yeah? Uh, with rook fc1 fo to follow. Yeah, I mean, 
Bishop a3 puts so much pressure on Black's queen side. I think the big question is uh, piggybacking off of an earlier suggestion you made, Peter, Bishop d7. I think this question has to be asked first and foremost by Magnus Carlsen. Can I get my bishop out of its initial square? Can I get the tactics to work? Now, after bishop b d7, bishop takes b7, you get an incredibly sharp position, which potentially involves an exchange sacrifice. But I'm pretty sure that things work out for Black here. So you have a takes b5. Now, the queen is attacked two different ways. So queen takes a, it is forced. Queen takes a, bishop takes a, and you get a scenario where both bishops are hanging, but it's very obvious which bishop Black takes. Of course, uh, he takes the dark squared bishop, and the critical detail to foresee here is that bishop to b2 is going to win back the exchange and grant Black a completely workable endgame because White has to waste the tempo moving the bishop out of a8. So this line works out for Black. I'm pretty sure Prague has calculated it, and of course, uh, bishop takes b7. That's the move which isn't forced. But if white isn't playing bishop takes b7, that probably means he's playing bishop takes d6 first. And then you get even crazier tactics because black has to play a takes b5 intermezzo. You get more desperado sex. Bishop takes c7. My goodness. We could get something like this happening on the board. This is what we're missing. Tactical fireworks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and this is uh, this is modern chess. This is the this is the highest level of chess. That seemingly strategic position. In order to make sense to it, you have to look for all these uh, forcing lines. The reason why the players are also burning a lot of time on the clock. We do see the move. Bishop takes e seven. Uh, queen takes e seven. Queen b four suggested by the computer. And mm -hmm. I, I think that if White gets uh, one two moves, then it's clear that uh, this will be. Excellent for white. Uh, black has these double pawns. White has the initiative. On the other hand, black will try everything in his power to play as concretely as possible with the queen a5 move challenging that beautiful uh, queen on b4. At some point, I guess bishop c6 will come to, to mind, making sure that that bishop from f3 is neutralized. And after bishop takes c6, b takes c6, black would solve his strategical problems. Uh, everything move per move, it's uh, it's one of those ultra high uh, quality kind of uh, chess questions that needs to be uh, calculated and decided over the board. And this is a difficult calculation task, but it resembles, I think, in the terminology of Alexander Kotov, the, the Soviet GM who, who codified a lot of the calculation process in his famous book, Think Like a Grandmaster. I think he distinguishes between I forget the exact terminology, but he calls one type of calculation uh, a branches and the other type of calculation, like in Russian, it's it's debris, but it doesn't mean debris. It's a false friend. It's like a thicket, right? And the thicket is when the lines are short, but there's a lot of them. And a branch is when there's you know one line, but you have to calculate uh, very deeply. And I think this is more of the latter, where after Bishop D7, you know, there's only two candidate moves for white. And both of them lead to a lot of exchanges in a row. So, you know, Carlson might spend 20, 30 minutes here, but if he's playing Bishop D7, then he's very confident that he's calculated everything correctly. If he's not playing Bishop D7, well, then what is he playing? What are the other candidate moves? There's Bishop H3. I I'm afraid to even mention that move because it might be even <laughs> more complicated than Bishop D7. But you could also try to bail out entirely and just move the rook away from A and, and say, you know, to heck with it. You know, I'm just going to keep the stability of the position. Yeah, many questions. However, after the move bishop a3, one sense is that there are all these tactical options which were not really in the position. So the caliber of Magnus Carlsen senses that. The big question, yes, bishop d7 or bishop h3, which are the very first moves that come to Magnus's mind, mind with which he starts his calculation. Because there is... A lot to talk about in both cases. Bishop this and we have already covered. It's very interesting. The other possibility is playing the move to h3. <laughs> I believe it's based on the very same idea that after move like bishop takes b7 would be no. Wow, this is, uh, this is surprising. So after bishop d7, actually bishop takes b7 was met by a takes b5, but now a takes b5 isn't correct oh wow let's just show this here yeah. a b5 queen takes a8 queen takes a8 
Bishop takes eight. Before with the bishop on this and we were claiming that two bishops are hanging, the bishop on a3 and the bishop on a8. Now there is a third uh, aspect, the bishop on a3 hitting the rook on f1, and suddenly it turns out that this now favors white. In insane. <laughs> Someone hand me an Advil. <laughs> Being oh the, the the point being that the pawn on b5 is vulnerable. So, for example, if black plays the same line like bishop takes a3, white, for example, falls back with the bishop to g2. Then after the trade, bishop b2, white is not panicking because of the double attack, but he can capture the pawn with knight b5. That's one of the key differences uh, what I'm seeing computer is showing. <laughs> this all reminds me of a lecture that uh, Vessel and Tapalov, the former world champion, uh, gave uh, here in, in Charlotte a couple of months ago. Uh, and, you know, he has this very famous game that he lost against uh, Gary Kaspara from Vaikanze. And uh, he was showing all these variations. And uh, then he showed all of these variations and he shifted a pawn from, I don't remember, h7 to h6. And somewhere, you know, 10 moves down one of the variations, there was one king move uh, and one square that wasn't controlled, you know, and that would have changed if you unspool everything the entire evaluation of the initial sacrifice. So this, I'm getting those kinds of vibes here where, you know, this is high level calculation. You, you might be looking at this and saying, man, this is so complicated. Everything is hanging. You know, this is why these players are paid the big bucks. And this is why Magnus and Prague are sitting uh, at this table and not anybody else. It's because they are capable of calculating these types of lines accurately. But will Magnus open this Pandora's box? I, I would vote no because there seem to be other reasonable candidate moves that seem to be easier to calculate, Peter. Would you say that's a reasonable take? Well, but which exactly? The bishop d7 line I liked <laughs> yeah, a lot. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, what, what you want to... You mentioned the move rook b8, I think, back then. Yeah. Uh, being, being a move. But... No. Uh, okay, so let's first take on d6. Let's make sure that... The bishop a3 move had its purpose. How does okay. black recapture? So again, a takes b5, I think might be tempting, but bishop takes c7, that desperado move always is a huge problem. So black has to take back on d6. My instinct is to take back with a pawn, trying to maintain the sort of integrity of the central pawn structure. And I guess you would delay b takes a6 and try to apply pressure on my queen side with something like rook a b1. Yes, I would like to do that. Very risk-free position here for white as a result, I think. Yes, uh, I mean, we're going to follow rook fc1, queen can fall back to a3, beautifully eyeing that pawn on d6. And black has some weaknesses. Pawn on b7 is, is clearly a big weakness. White's bishop on f3 is a monster. Rook on b1 is doing an excellent job. It's uh, one of these uh, type of positions that are maybe quite solid they might not be so bad but uh, sitting from the black side it's no fun yeah i mean again the engine evaluation is always so misleading here it looks it does look like white is having uh, all of the fun as as you're saying a huge decision uh for, for magnus carlson here i mean he can take this game in essentially three at least three completely different directions and we haven't even mentioned you know bishop takes a three which I think is unlikely because it plays right into White's hands, right? It, it keeps the structure the way that it currently is. And I think Prague would be very happy to see this exchange. Now the bishop from c8 can't really move at all because of bishop takes b7. And black has essentially paralyzed himself. And as you're indicating, rook fc1 is almost a pre-move for white when, when the situation does become really critical on the queen side with all of black's pawns essentially under fire. Yes, uh, basically the bishop on d6 is the bishop that cements black's position. It's, uh, it's a very useful bishop. If we just trade it, then, then the pawn on e5, the pawn on c7, the pawn on b7 is already weak. The, the reason why we haven't been talking about the weakness on c7 and e5 were exactly the thanks to that monster bishop on d6, which gave black the stability. That's also the reason why Prague has opted for bishop a3. He feels that if he is able to trade the dark squared bishops and black is not able to solve his problems by tactical means immediately, then it will be a long-lasting edge for white. And it comes, you know, I started to speculate. You did mention the move 
just very quickly to show the nuances that mm -hmm. should we play d3 h6 bishop a3 now if we would have played the move bishop a3 i believe that this tactical idea with bishop d7 would not work because of no fork with bishop b2 ah the knights defended wow that's yes. so cool yeah we can just go through that entire line maybe really quickly um to show how fine the margins can be at this level between a tactic that works and one that fails right white drops the bishop back you play bishop b2 and um you end up as as the russian expression goes at a, at a broken gate right you okay where's the fork there is no fork the rook moves over to b1 and black can resign yes so this was the justification behind the idea bishop is the insisting on trading the bishops on the other hand clearly we talked about the fact that these the h6 if not for any tactical ideas it would be in white's favor uh very tough this these are the delicatesses that over the board is just impossible to understand but for analysts very important to highlight uh, making everyone understand how difficult and complex a chess game is absolutely and uh, we're seeing how long magnus is thinking on this move it's now been 13 minutes and you can sense the wheels turning in his brain bishop d7 is obviously on the table i would predict uh that end game to happen on the board as our likeliest outcome but you know it is impossible to put yourself in magnus's head i mean bishop h3 bishop d7 rook b8 so many ways that he can that he can play here but it feels to me peter that if magnus accurately calculates bishop d7 he will be attracted by the kind of sweet nectar of an end game that i think he feels he can hold pretty comfortably yes you know that end game we looked at after bishop d7 white has the more comfortable position but i just feel like magnus when possible will, will rely on his pedigree and his ability to hold slightly worse end games with ease yes uh, absolutely agreed i feel that uh, if magnus goes for bishop d7 and he kind of sees the whole picture he mm. makes sure that he can do that he will handle the the slight difficulties i mean white will have some pressure but uh, clear that black already has a direction he knows where to go with right now he has to decide between directions the reason why i'm believing that he will play the move bishop d7 first of all you cannot be lazy in certain situations and magnus shows it that he has moved h6 instantly he knew that he had to make that move strategically speaking but now if he is not understanding he doesn't sense this moment then he will miss that and he will be tortured it will be a very unpleasant defensive task and that's exactly the reason why magnus is now spending all his time and energy to make sure that he neutralizes white's pressure with some tactical uh, skirmish i mean it's the the pressure with which prague plays is is really something else i mean we're only 13 moves in and black is already under serious pressure you know carlson is in a situation where you know not to overstate the case here but if he makes the wrong decision right if he plays bishop takes a3 for instance yeah the position could get really bad uh strategically within a couple of moves so magnus senses the importance of the moment you don't feel at all like first of all you don't feel like Prague is under 2700 because he's not but you feel like this is a seasoned you know levon aronian-esque 2750 gm sitting with uh across from carlson so impressive the way that Prague has been able to put pressure uh, on his opponent in the early going of this game. And I think Magnus doing a great job of taking as long as it requires uh, to, to work his way through this thicket of variations. Yes, I think also we have to highlight one thing that yes, Prague did start the tournament with less than 2700, but his life rating is already over 2720. Mm -hmm. It shows that he carries a lot of momentum and I also feel like with 2720, he's still heavily underrated. It just shows my uh, respect uh, towards him. The reason why he wasn't skyrocketing with the rating that he was busy learning chess last year in the Champions Chess Tour, playing in all these uh, fantastic tournaments, and was already an equal opponent to the very best players. It was for my taste. I was following that tournament as a commentator just a question of time when his rating will adjust to his playing level and i'm very happy to see that to happen yeah i think i think we all are uh, he's he's such an easy young man to root for 
you know, very modest and let's, let's his moves do the talking, which, uh, I think mm -hmm. is, is awesome and was, was super, uh, fun to train with great sense of humor. And, uh, yeah, he's got Magnus Carlson under a little bit of pressure, but Bishop D seven, that, that we are watching a big moment of truth here. Uh, this game can head in, in several different directions and we're up to 17 minutes. Uh, Peter, I think the, the British grandmaster, John Nunn, uh, he made a kind of provocative rhetorical point that, uh, anytime someone spends 15 minutes or over, they make a mistake. Obviously that's not true. And obviously in some positions, a longer thinking time is warranted, but there are players who almost never spend, you know, l let alone 15 minutes, 10 minutes uh, on a move or more. Someone like Yana Pomnishi, where do you stand on this question of like maximum thinking time? Yes, I think I'm the right <laughs> person to ask this because throughout my career, I had, you know, those kind of longest uh, things. Uh, one of my longest thoughts was against Levon Alunian in Morelia, 2008. I spent 86 minutes on one single move in the opening because it was one of those most uh, craziest novelties from Levon, some Queen A4, the hanging pawn on F2. I have just played some Knight EG4 or Knight, F yeah, Knight FG4 with the Queen on B6, letting Queen takes F2 check to an uncastled King on E1 and Levon just said it like, Please, Peter, you want to take on F2? <laughs> take that pawn. And he opted for Queen A4, and I fell for an 86 minute, uh, very deep thoughts. I discovered kind of America 100 times during my calculations. It was fantastic that afterwards, because back then engines were not that strong, I went so deep into the position that I understood what kind of dangers are looming despite the computer <laughs> being critical of White's idea. However, all these uh, swords did not help me because finally I made a neutral move, you know. I just throw in the towel. I said like, okay, I agree to be slightly worse, but I just can't go for this uh, crazy mess uh, that uh, Levon is provoking. And I ended up playing 20 moves with one or two minutes on my clock in time trouble. It was, it was crazy and I did manage to escape. Uh, and Levon always used to be one of my most unpleasant opponents. I lost so many games, but that one I managed to draw. Wow. What what a story. I mean, I can't say that I spent over an hour on a move. I think that happened a couple of times. Um, of course, there are all these uh, stories, uh, most of them urban legends. I mean, one of them involves, I think, Mikhail Tall, uh, who was playing, I forget who, maybe it was Geller. And uh, in the old days, the time control was vast, uh, you know, two and a half hours for 30 moves. And then you got time additions and the game was adjourned and you know the story goes that uh tall attended an opera performance and left halfway and when he came back his opponent was still thinking about the board but one story that is uh true uh in the memoirs of paul morphy's uh friend frederick edge who accompanied morphy to europe uh he talks about lewis powelson who was one of the strongest players that morphy faced in the u.s and powelson was very disliked by uh players in the 1800s because there were no chess clocks at the time they existed but they were not in wide use and powelson once spent two hours on a single move against paul morphy and frederick edge describes how morphy sat completely still the entire time and then after the game ended morphy came up to edge and he's like i'm never playing this guy again uh he literally said that so just be thankful that we have chess clocks and we don't have to wait two hours for magnus carlson to move his bishop one square Yes, uh, great story. And also, uh, I like to appreciate uh, Magnus's feeling, yeah, that uh, because Magnus is not known for spending too much time for no reason. Yeah, it's, it's the reason that he understands that, yes, if I just make those routine type of moves, uh, the position might become really unpleasant. I have to change. And thanks to the computer, we were able to navigate the lines with Bishop D7 with, with quite, e quite an ease. Uh, over the board, nobody tells you that the move bishop d7 is working. Yeah, you first have to have your intuition, then you start calculating. Then there are tons of lines, and you feel like if you just miscalculate in one of them, you lose on the spot. Yeah, and uh, this this kind of things. Then you also probably realize that ah, hang on, let me also combine calculating the same lines with bishop h3, and that's where you can end up investing uh, tons of time. And you made a great point about you know forecasting the nature of the position like are you expecting 
things to remain tense for 20 moves, or are you expecting the situation to clarify uh, within a couple of moves? And that also defines the amount of time you spend. If you feel like, okay, if I find the right move here, we'll liquidate immediately into an equal endgame. Hagnus can play an equal endgame perfectly with only 10 minutes on his clock. So maybe then he spends another 20 minutes. If he feels that, okay, even if I make the right decision, the position will remain very tense, well, then probably you'll set yourself a deadline of five to 10 minutes. So there's all these meta questions, not only about what you're thinking about, but how long to think about. And at least I sometimes try to do this when I give myself sort of a hard deadline for making a move. Unfortunately, like most deadlines in my life, they're purely symbolic. And, you know, uh, you end, uh, the importance of making the right move starts to transcend, uh, you know, this arbitrary deadline that you set yourself. Yes, uh, and over the board, it's also very important. I do know that also another reason when you can burn unlimited amount of time on the clock during a chess game when you want to be too perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, of course, in a completely different scenario. It's at the moment when you feel like, yes, I have an advantage and I have to be super delicate. Yeah, that's also when you can lose the reality. Yeah, that you try to be so perfect that uh, suddenly you you don't see the forest from the trees yeah that's uh, that's kind of uh, the the problem you shouldn't go so deep yeah in a practical game you have to always find this balance how do i navigate practical problems with uh, with deep calculation but trying to overdo that it's a very risky situation now for magnus it's completely different because he knows exactly that yes uh, if I go for complications and if I'm able to calculate them out, I might be uh, solving my problems. And this is the driving force. Having said that, we don't know what goes through Magnus's mind. Do you read something from his body language? What is he thinking about? Yeah, it's, I still maintain that he's calculating Bishop D7 because it's one of those things. When we go through the lines, we're also casting away all of the wrong moves. And when you're sitting there at the board, you don't have anybody tapping you on the shoulder telling you which piece to capture. And you don't know what the evaluation of the position is, right? When you know, according to the eval bar, it's equal, you have this sense of comfort that, okay, I'm going down the right path. You know, no matter who you are, whether you're Magnus, you know, or, or your God himself, you don't know what the evaluation of the move is. For all you know, Bishop D7 might lose the game because, you know, in some lines, you're giving away the rook on A8. And you really have to make sure that that very flimsy mechanism with the bishop from a3 coming to b2, right? If that fails, then you lose the game. So that's how thin the margins are. And, you know, I would be triple and quadruple checking that at the board, which maybe is what Magnus is doing. Um, so I, I do think he's focusing on bishop d7. If he concludes that he's not confident enough in those lines, I think he might choose bishop h3. Uh, but... I really don't see him playing rook b8 or bishop takes bishop here because that essentially, as you put it, Peter, would be throwing in the towel strategically and saying, I'm going to accept, you know, kind of getting tortured for a long time. And that's even less appealing given that Magnus has already invested 25 minutes and has not that much time. He's already spent half of his allotted time for the, for the first 40 moves. Yes, once you invest so much time, you certainly don't want to be slightly worse and giving your op opponent uh, tons of option of keeping the, the pressure on. Yeah, you, you feel like you invest a lot of energy, then you want to get some clarity. Yeah, you want to get the benefit. And if finally Magnus, after analyzing and calculating Bishop D and Bishop H3, and for some reason says that no, but I'm unable to uh, find, calculate myself through the jungle, and then plays a neutral move like rook b8, that does not work together. Then then he will pay a high price, I believe. He, If he already spends time, he has to make sure that he solves his problems, at least gets clarity to the situation. Indeed. And I wanted to take this opportunity to shout out uh, over 100,000 people watching this broadcast, including about 80,000 on YouTube. Of course, both of these players, well, Magnus, he's had a lot of fans for well over a decade, but Prague, uh, has has tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of fans, uh, of course, in his home country of India, which uh, lends its full support uh, to this very exciting group of young players uh, who benefit from the support of so many fans, but also across the world. 
uh, players and, and fans who are watching uh, this new crop of talent rise and try to unseat the older generation. It's such an exciting time uh, to be watching chess tournaments. And uh, so we thank everybody for taking time out of your busy, busy work days and uh, lending your full support uh, to your favorite player, whether it is uh, the exciting Pragnananda or the stalwart Magnus Carlsen. Okay, the tension could not be higher. It's now 27 minutes, Peter. I mean, we're getting into that territory of longest thinking time in the World Cup. I am sure that someone took over 30 minutes on a move, but we might be in like top five longest think times in the World Cup territory. For sure, yeah. This is also the, the FIDE classical time control. So the players don't have two hours on their clock. It's uh, 90 minutes plus 30 seconds increment. Uh, it, it basically forces the players to be as practical as possible. It's, uh, it's just so crazy to get down into crazy time trouble with all the pressure. And uh, also when you have you have, for example, the situation that your opponent has still a lot of time and you end up in time pressure. That's, that's kind of a total nightmare scenario. And Magnus has played the move. B8. And, and wow, okay. Whoa. Then Magnus, Magnus will be in for a very, very difficult time. Okay. Rook B8 is his choice. And he's not making this move willingly, ultimately not trusting his calculation. And I think it is safe to say now, Peter, that Rook B8 was always the kind of emergency option for Magnus. And I think it's clear in the context of how much time was spent that he was calculating Bishop D7. I thought that he would trust his calculation, but you know, it, it, we can't say for sure that he didn't. You know, maybe he calculated to that end game and felt that he wants to preserve, you know, winning chances uh, with the queens on the board. I know it's weird to talk about it. Yeah, white is currently better, but here at least the queens are on the board and the position is more undefined. So a big, big decision made by Magnus Carlsen that ensures. I think a longer middle game and a more complex middle game, which is a treat for us uh, as Pragnananda responds to this very important decision uh, with an important decision of his own. And we will respond by taking our second break of the day. The action is breakneck. I mean, we're getting the excitement of a blitz tournament, but the quality of a classical tournament with over 100,000 people watching our broadcast. Uh, it's an honor to be commentating the World Cup final. And we will be back with more action from this first match game of the finals in just a couple of short minutes. Today we're going to go down into the New York City subway, set up a table on the subway platform and see if we can get some strangers waiting for their trains to play chess with us. All right, now I'm going to see if I can get anybody. Uh, I'll be white. White. Sounds like he knows what he's doing a little bit. Don't worry, I'm not that good. Yeah? You're just out here playing chess, not that good. Got the chess.com app. Do you ever play on your phone? Oh, yeah. He said he barely played. I'm a teacher. What do you teach? Chess. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Self-defense. How do you stay sane? Uh, I used to do a lot of meditation. Take medication. <laughs> What's like lesson 101 of self-defense? Run. What are you listening to right now? Train. Sean Paul. Ed Sheeran. What is the meaning of life? It's funny because like what I'm doing, I feel like doesn't align with my philosophy on what the meaning of life is. But it's like obviously spend as much time with family as possible. Be the best person you can be. Get closer to God. Not to be evil to each other. There you go. Good game. Thanks for playing. Good, Good game, game thanks brother. for playing. Appreciate it. I'll see you in a self-defense class. Enjoy Harry Styles. What's the best way to follow any chess event from the Champions Chess Tour to the Candidates, Speed Chess Championship, Title Tuesday, FIDE World Championship, and so much more? Chess.com slash events has all of the top chess tournaments played both over the board and online. Analyze and review games from the world's greatest players with live commentary, cloud analysis, opening explorer, and table bases. Find all the key event information, including schedules, prizes, results, news reports, player bios, tie breaks, and more. 
even compete by voting for your predicted results. Explore chess.com slash events today on web or with our iOS and Android apps and experience chess like never before. We are back. The concentration is palpable as Magnus Carlsen take a, takes a sip of his mystery beverage and sets it back down. Pragnananda and Magnus Carlsen here at the finals of the 2023 World Cup. The tension on the board could not be higher. You can just see every ounce of energy. What remains of these players' energy after such a difficult run, particularly for Prague, being exerted on this critical match. Elton John's song, I'm Still Standing. Yeah, 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 comes to mind. These players, the only two still standing and fighting for first place, Peter. What a story it's been. I mean, this is just awesome. Yes, and it was also very nice, your reference to Elton John's classic. Uh, during tournaments, when I was completely exhausted, I was listening to that song. It was always the energizing song that gave me strength to continue the tournament. And uh, yes, we shouldn't be forgetting the World Cup started officially on the 29th of July. Yes, uh, the top seeds uh, did enter the, the tournament on the 2nd August, if, if I'm not mistaken. And ever since, they are battling it out. And in every single match, just one mistake can cost elimination. This takes so much more extra mental energy from the players that even once you qualify from a match, yeah, you, you win a match, you can't really relax because you know exactly that tomorrow another match is coming and you have to be, again, super precise. Only like this you can stay alive in this tournament. Just super grueling. It is indeed. And speaking of that song, it also has the lyric, I think, uh, looking like a true survivor, feeling like a little kid. Uh, Prague, obviously not a little kid anymore. He is uh, blossoming into a, a young adult. But man, at 18 years old, such an exciting time in his chess career. He's got so much time uh, before he even reaches his peak. Now, he's got a lot of time in this position, 57 minutes to be exact. Just to update people, if you're joining us uh, late, first of all, where have you been? Make sure you don't go anywhere uh, because the action is about to reach its peak. We're only 13 moves in. Prague playing the English, which he played against Hikaru Nakamura. Magnus responding with a slightly rare sixth move, the knight retreat back to f6 rather than b6. And Prague responding with the move b4, which was played against Magnus Carlsen by Jan Apomnishi uh, a couple of years ago in a rapid game. The first new move was bishop d6 uh, against Jan. Magnus halted the progress of the b-pawn with a6. And Prague challenging Magnus's setup, advancing b5, and immediately deploying his queen to a4, uh, challenging the knight, which drops into the center, and kind of clarifying the structure that we see 
on the board in the current position. We got the trade on F3, uh, both sides tucking their king away on uh, the safe side of the board. And then this critical move, A6, which is ignored by Prague because the rook on A8 is hanging. So Prague plays D3, H6 to prevent bishop G5. And this was the first critical moment for white. We were contemplating various moves, Prague deciding on bishop A3, which was one of our top choices. And then perhaps the most important moment of the game, Carlson spends 27 minutes calculating the wild complications arising after the two developing moves by the bishop, bishop D7, and perhaps the even crazier bishop H3, but deciding against it. And before the break, we saw Carlson shifting his rook to B8 and tossing the ball back into Prague's court. And now the big question, how is Pragnananda going to continue? Will he take on A6? Will he make a general improving move such as rook B1 or rook C1? What is your call, Peter? I think that uh, we were also praising Magnus for sensing critical moment, uh, critical moments of, of the game. And Prague is doing the same. He feels like, hang on, wait a second. Magnus did not go for the crazy lines. What does it mean? What does it signal to me? Yeah, if, if you are there, first of all, I believe Prague is kind of relieved because he knows exactly that after Luke B8, Black is in for a long defensive task. Yes, uh, with Magnus's technical level, one could argue that, yes, if it's only going to be a tiny advantage, then Magnus will be able to neutralize that. Yes, it could easily be true. On the other hand, Prague knows exactly that he's risking nothing and he has a chance to, to get something out of this game. And that's why he slows down. He feels that this is a very important moment and there are so many tempting options. Rook FC1, Rook AB1, do you trade on D6 first? And in order to understand which one you prefer, which decision leads to what type of position, you have to spend time. And B takes A6 loses the game, I'm pretty sure. It started to dawn on me uh, as, as you were elucidating the various candidate moves. I think BA6, Bishop D7 is a trap. Look at this. And this is exquisitely constructed by Magnus because the queen has two different squares on which it maintains contact with the bishop. Queen A5, B6 literally traps the queen. It's not even about the bishop. The queen is lost. And Queen B3, B takes A6 is a discovered attack, pushing the queen away, making it lose contact with the bishop. White drops an entire minor piece. So that can be ruled out immediately. I mean... Man, Magnus's play has little spikes on it, All uh, right? You make one little misstep, and uh, that is how close you always are at this level to making a fatal mistake. Prague will see that, and I think he will narrow his choice, uh, let's say, to three moves. Maybe bishop takes bishop, rook fc1, and I think rook ab1, I would argue, are his main choices in this position. Yes, certainly. I mean, those are, those were the moves. I did miss the move. B, I mean, did did miss that B takes A6, Bishop D7 is winning for black. Just intuitively, the move B takes A6 did not look right. Maybe also for the fact that I'm believing Magnus. Yeah, if, if Magnus plays the move Rook B8 and invites B takes A6, then there is something in the air. It's clear that Magnus will never play Rook B8 with the intention of going B takes A6, spoiling his pawn structure and will be strategically lost. So... You have to sense that. And uh, after rook b8, the reason why I'm kind of tempted to capture on d6 first, just to make sure that all this tactical uh, craziness is, is taken out of the position. Uh, on the other hand, after bishop takes d6, black has this option of capturing c takes d6. If that's something of a concern for Prague, that he feels that after cd6, black will be very solid and my advantage might be just symbolic then uh, there are also good arguments to to say that all right okay so black has played rook b8 so probably he is uh, wanting to play bishop d7 or black is also wanting to play a b5 so mm -hmm. let me get ready for all of these options i agree I, I something tells me bishop takes d6 uh is is the sort of the safer option the option that removes this uh, potential for some sort of freak tactic to occur because the queen uh, is the most powerful piece, but that makes it the worst defender because it is the easiest piece along with a king to attack. And most attacks on the queen have to be responded to. So you have to be very careful anytime the queen is the only piece that's supervising uh, the tension between two minor pieces. Um, well, as Prague con considers his next move, I think we've got a good chance to maybe spend like a minute or two on our other game, uh, on our third place game, 
because that is also a very exciting position. We promise we will not miss any action in the Prague game, folks. The moment a move is made, we will come back to this game. But we've got some scintillating tactical potential in our Catalan game between Abasov and Caruana. Things still looking really good for Abasov. Now, Peter, he did play the move E5, but he played it later than we expected. But I think it's come with the same great effect. Yes, now that we see that uh, Fabi has opted for knight h7, that signals us that after queen e7, if white would have played e5, black would have answered it with knight h7. And then what would be more natural than to double the rooks with rook g3, just as happened in the game? So in the game, Abbasov went for rook g3, rook d 8 rook a g1, hitting that pawn on g7. Fabi had to go passive with rook g8, defending. You don't want to weaken. Uh, with g6, rook g8 gives much more stability. Now white pushes the pawn to e5, knight h7 played, and now the move knight e4 looks like the most tempting option heading towards the d6 square. The reason, then why is Abasov taking his time? I believe it's pretty understandable that if you play knight e4 heading to, towards the d6 square, you know exactly that black will move that knight from d7, I don't know exactly if knight b6 or knight df8. And whenever you land that knight on d6, black will not blink twice, will simply eliminate that knight, sacrifice an exchange. That's a thematic positional exchange sacrifice uh, a la uh, Tigran Petrosian, the legendary war champion. And then suddenly, okay, let's even show this on the board, even after knight df8, knight d6. Let me just highlight what I'm talking about, ed6, queen d6. A complete change, complete transformation of structure happens. Uh, white will have vulnerable pawn structure. Black will be very solid. Black's knight will start jumping back. I don't know, knight g6 or knight d7. Yes, white will still rely on this f4, f5 break. But certainly, before you let something like this happen, you look for all alternatives and you are also calculating all the forcing lines. Absolutely. And one of the things you're trying to measure is when you play this move f5. So... If we rewind, first of all, to the 22nd move, this is not the time to play f5. Why not? You have to spot the x-ray that the black rook is exerting on white's queen. f5 runs into knight takes e5, and white's position falls apart immediately. But should you first play knight e4, and should black move the knight from d7, then the appeal of f5 is greatly increased. I also wanted to point out one line. If black tries knight c5 here, it fails for two reasons, <laughs> both of them very instructive. The first is queen a3, which wins a piece on the x-ray. But the prettier line is knight takes c5, queen takes c5. This would solve all of black's problems because without the knight, white doesn't have you know th the proper type of Phillips screwdriver to access the weak squares. But in comes queen takes h7 check, a scintillating desperado. Then you recapture the queen. This is a classic worth remembering. And uh, white emerges up a bishop in the end game. So black can't solve his problems directly. He will have to move that knight on d7 to a more passive square and prepare for the exchange sacrifice. And that leads me to my main point, which is that knight f8 could be met or knight b6 could be met with f5, first trying to shatter black's pawn cover and then after e takes f5, dropping the knight into d6 and, and really trying to open up the position. By the way, Prague, he has just captured on d6 as we expected. Uh, so we'll get back to that game shortly. But Still feels very good for Abasov. And we have Queen e3. He doesn't play knight e4. Ooh. Ugh. Yes. Uh, it's a little bit, I mean, showing too much uh, respect for the pin along the d file. Uh, Queen e3, a solid move. On the other hand, it gives black eventually some time. I do see that the computer mentions instantly the shocking move, a brilliant move, f7, Ooh. f5. Uh, with the justification of fighting for the e4 square and making sure that white won't be able to land the knight. Now imagine black gets some time, knight b6 gets control of the d5 square, looks uh, perfectly healthy. And after e takes f6, uh, clearly then black, I don't know, captures with the knight from d7 to f6. And white's pawn structure is again very damaged. The weakness on e6 doesn't mean anything. So a big opportunity for Fabi eventually to get rid of all these dangers that we have been talking about, knight e4 and f4, f5 looming in the air by a fantastic f7, f5 toss here. It feels like queen e3 is a nervy move. Abbasov just not deciding on the most principled approach. 
And even if Fabi plays knight b6 here, uh, it feels like white has lost the opportunity to play f5. And even the move knight c3 to e4 no longer comes with the same effect because it runs into knight d5 with tempo. So Fabi, he has got to be thrilled uh, seeing the move queen to e3. A boss up there might have missed an opportunity to put really serious pressure on Fabi with knight e4. So we will uh, keep a very close eye on uh, the way that Fabiano Caruana defends this difficult position. And speaking of difficult positions, uh, it's a difficult one for Magnus Carlsen as well. And we've got a series of very important moves. Prague has indeed initiated the trade on d6. The pawn structure is now nearly symmetrical. And uh, we're expecting a kind of general improving move like rook c1 or rook b1, maintaining a stable but very small advantage. Yes, so bishop takes d6, c takes d6. I believe absolutely clear that Magnus was relying on the move c takes d6. We discussed earlier that if this type of in this type of positions, these bishops would just disappear from the board. Uh, if, if we can just remove them, then suddenly black spawn on c7 and d5 will be very vulnerable. That adds to the problem on the b7 pawn. And all this uh, pressure together combined can be very devastating. So after rook b8, bishop takes d6, c takes d6, no surprise there. Magnus sticks to his plan. And if black was to, for example, trade on b5, get the bishop out to d7 or e6 and push d6, d5, the, the reason why I was highlighting bishop d7 clear with the idea of placing the bishop to c6 and then pushing d6, d5, black would solve all his problems. So white's advantage is based on the fact that Black is not yet developed, so white needs to be super quick and super energetic on the queen side. Yeah, and super precise, right? You play b takes a6 at the wrong moment, you let black get that bishop out, you know, and, and not a trace remains of white's advantage because the advantage is very much, how should I put it? It's it's ephemeral. It's, it's based on a very flimsy uh, factor, which is uh, potentially temporary. Uh, control that white has over the long diagonal and the temporary advantage in peace activity, but give black two moves and, you know, that advantage is completely erased. So Prague, I think, doing a good job investing more time in this moment. And he understands that worst comes to worst, he plays a move like rook b1, white's not really risking, right? Precision isn't important in the sense that you're going to lose the game uh, if you play a slightly imprecise move, but you definitely might lose the lion's share of your advantage. To me, Peter, rook b1 is the most natural move because it actually creates a threat. It threatens b takes a6 and forces black's hand. On the other hand, after a takes b5, okay, what do you recapture with? If you recapture with a queen, that's a little bit awkward. You can't take with a rook because of bishop d7. That's a little bit annoying. And if you take with a knight, then you take your eyes off of the d5 square. So all three recaptures have clear drawbacks, and maybe this uh, causes Prague to choose a different rook move. Yes, it's a very delicate position. If if black gets this a takes b5 and d6 d5 in, locks out the bishop on f3 and activates his bishop uh, via d7 to, to c6 or the bishop to e6 uh, reinforcing the d6 d5 move, black will be very happy neutralizing white's pressure. You very nicely highlighted that rook ab1 a b5, I think that black would be in a lot of trouble if white would be able to capture with the rook. Just give white one more move, queen b4, and we get everything what we desire. The pressure on the b7 pawn, black not able to developing the bishop from c8, and we are also controlling the d5 square. So that would be an ideal scenario, but it's not possible. And rook a b1 is on the board, so we are very likely to see uh, that exact decision. Of course, between knight takes b5 and queen takes b5 made by Prague. Is it fair to say, Peter, that the game is starting to head a little bit in the, in the direction of a draw here? Or is that too early of a conclusion to make? I think a little bit early. It's still, yeah. uh, if you ask Prague, he says, no, no, <laughs> wait, a, wait a second, guys. I, I want to get something out Hold of this on. position. And <laughs> yeah. Yes, and if we would be turning the board and Magnus would have the white pieces, he would say, no, 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 forget guys about draw. I'm very interested about this game. So yes, we are simply assuming that Magnus with his tremendous uh, strategic feel and with his experience, he will be most probably able to neutralize white's pressure, but there is still a pressure. 
and a b5 is the move another move would be bishop d7 but that runs into queen a3 the move uh, we already mentioned with a very powerful threat of capturing on d6 the pawn on d6 is clearly black soul at this moment we, we do believe that uh, magnus will play a b5 and then the question is uh, do you have a preference how would you danya play this position from the white side I would be tempted by queen takes b5 because to me the control over the d5 square may be the most important factor here. As long as white keeps that bind, it feels like black is in a little bit of discomfort. And yeah, bishop d7, on that note, I would play queen b3 and, you know, all eyes on deck, all eyes on the d5 square. You know, black plays bishop c6 and even the position after knight d5. If you exchange all of the pieces, I think the computer evaluation really doesn't tell the whole story here. I feel like this is unpleasant, right? And this is what makes me agree with you, Peter, that this is not just a draw and we shouldn't be fooled by the symmetrical structure. Magnus has a little bit of work to do here should this position be reached. And it's likely to be reached. A takes B5 is already on the board. And I will point out one more thing, which is that among the skills that Prague has demonstrated in this tournament is the ability uh, to squeeze out very small advantages. He did that in a must-win game with the black pieces, having lost to Eric Icy in the first match game. He won the second on demand uh, with only a tiny advantage in the end game. So it's not like he hasn't demonstrated an ability to do what he needs to do in this position. We have queen takes b5 on the board. The move's being made much, much faster now. Yes, the position has simplified. I also believe that there is a very important uh, variation that after bishop d7, my favorite move had, would have been queen b6. I really like this that endgame can be very nasty for black because of the two weaknesses however i feel that with a timely bishop c6 so my feeling was like queen takes b6 rook takes b6 and probably the move rook fc8 being super important hitting that knight uh -huh. my plan would have been knight d5 clearly i want to play this position takes takes i would be super happy black would be in a lot of trouble if not for this Little quiet move, stabilizing with bishop d7, c6, making sure that the pawn on b7 is protected and the bishop also uh, stops the 6th rank, guards the 6th rank uh, against white's look on b6, a multi-purpose move, solving all problems. That's a great line. It's such an important line. And clearly Magnus has calculated it because bishop d7 is on the board. And yet another important decision for Prague, queen b6 is a kind of bailout move. Again, white isn't really risking on either case. Queen b3, we were looking at earlier, but queen b4, I guess, also deserves a little bit of airtime hitting the pawn on d6. Unfortunately, after bishop c6, you could get that trade on c6 and then on b8, and Prague has to evaluate that resulting endgame because, yes, he has an outside passer on a2, but you have to give black a much superior pawn structure in so doing, and that might be the deal breaker. You trade on b8, Maybe Rook B1 trying to get that knight end game. And maybe this is worth investigating because if Black declines the Rook trade, then you're allowing, you know, White's Rook to infiltrate B6. If you trade Rooks, I would be a little bit scared of that outside passer. I don't know. It, yeah, computer shows equality, but I wouldn't know exactly how to evaluate this position. That's why Magnus Carlsen is sitting in that chair, not me. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's a tough call. Yeah, those kind of questions are never easy to answer without computer's guidance. Yeah, that the computer tells you that, yes, yes, it's a zero, zero position. Don't worry. But just one little nuance and it might be zero eighty. Yeah, and uh, the players are never sure about this. And I, I think this is also the, the most mystifying thing about chess. Yeah, that this, the, the players have this uncertainty. They never sure about the evolution of any position. So they have to rely on their intuition, on their skill, chess understanding, perfect calculation to make perfect sense of every single scenario. That's a great, great way to put it. Um, and yeah, just blindly looking at the computer eval, you would think that it doesn't even really matter where Prague puts his queen here. Yeah, everything is about the same evaluation, but you know, the three moves that we've examined so far just lead to completely different types of situations, both in terms of what pieces remain on the board, right? Queen b3 could lead to a heavy piece endgame with the minor pieces gone after bishop c6, knight d5. Queen b6 leads to one type of endgame. Queen b4 leads to another type of endgame. So these are important decisions, and the players don't know uh, that, that the evaluation is equal. For all prognos, 
you know, the, the difference here might be between a sizable advantage and an equal position. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if a significant amount of time is invested in this very important decision where to put the queen. If I had to make a guess, I think he's going to go queen b3. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's very hard to guess anything for me because the, the point is, I believe at some point you are influenced by the fact that you are facing Magnus Carlsen. Uh, and uh, a choice which you would make against any other player might be different to the one that uh, finally convince yourself uh, sitting opposite to Magnus. Uh, one thing we haven't uh, talked about, uh, our lovely team has given us incredible amount of statistics and one of the statistics was the overall score between these two incredible extraordinary gentlemen and magnus has won nine games including blitz rapid uh, classical but prague has also won five games winning wow. five games against magnus carson at the age of not even 18 because he just turned 18 during this tournament and they haven't met yet it's it shows that uh, Prague has the confidence, he has this incredible skill that yes, he's losing more games uh, to Magnus than he wins, but he beats Magnus also and this uh, shows that he believes that he can beat Magnus Carson. And the word poise also comes to mind because I pointed out earlier the most dangerous moment of the tournament for Prague when he lost the first game against his compatriot Arjun Ergeis with the white pieces, right? To win on demand with black, how hard, how incredible is that? But there was also a moment in uh, his Sikara Nakamura in the classical portion, uh, which seems like it was, you know, eons and, and galaxies ago. Uh, but a moment where he seemed to lose the thread, they went into an end game and Prague showing tremendous poise, holding that position in time pressure, taking that match to the rapid tiebreaker and then defeating Hikaru, uh, which is so hard to do. And of course, uh, my prediction was wrong. I uh, dutifully admit my guilt, queen to b6. Uh, your suggestion, Peter, is on the board and we will very likely see uh, a trade of queens here followed by rook fc8. Yes, and uh, I also have to give credit. We were a little bit harsh with Magnus that he spends 27 minutes and finally does not go for the complications. I think that uh, it shows how deep uh, he is a, as a player. Uh, definitely he has calculated those lines, but probably he convinced himself that none of them was clear enough finally mm -hmm. to, to go for. And he also had this rook b8 in his pocket right from the beginning. He could have blitzed that move out, uh, but he did not want to be lazy. So he did not opt for the move rook b8 because of, yes, okay, let me not play critical move. He probably have judged every single aspect of this position that yes it's a super dangerous position if just one minor detail is different i will be worse and the move bishop c6 appeared on the board very precise chess by magnus what is this based on there is a tactical justification if white takes twice on c6 then rook c8 is a dagger the knight on c3 undefended you have to be aware of all of your undefended pieces at all times this skewers the queen to the knight and white drops a minor piece so if Prague takes on c6, he will essentially have to follow up either with queen takes d8 or queen takes b8, reaching the position that we were discussing earlier. As an alternative, you don't, you're don't you under no obligation to take either piece. You could play rook fc1, but that allows black either to take on f3 and damage white's pawn structure or even to play d5 uh, and achieve that pawn advance, which eradicates uh, the weakness of the d5 square. So Prague could also take on d8, and then delay the move bishop takes c6. So it's kind of like a pick and choose situation uh, where you can trade one of two pieces or trade no pieces at all. More decisions to be made here for Prague. Yes, uh, actually bishop c6 was also the move that smiled on me when I first looked at queen b6. Like, okay, I would like to play queen b6. However, then computer very quickly also neutralized my idea of it takes, takes, look fc8 followed by bishop c6. Uh, Magnus is not a computer. I believe that he is humanly very happy that he's able to solve his problems with such an aesthetic move. This is always also a true art. I mean, the chess players are artists. Yeah, if we know that chess is now, especially with uh, less and less uh, time control, with less time, uh, becoming extreme sport. Yeah, there is so much tension. There is this tremendous sporting element, but deep inside the players have also this artistic feeling. 
And whenever there is a chance that you can make a move like Bishop D6 stylistic move, you will always prefer it compared to very simple mystic takes, takes, look FC8, Bishop C6. You want to spice things up. That's a great point. And, uh, you know, you find the golden, golden medium here between making an artistic aesthetic move, but one that also satisfies the objective criteria uh, of the position, which in this case is to trade off White's strongest piece. That is the bishop on F3. And Carlson's move is aimed precisely at satisfying that objective, which it does. It does so in style based on a tactic. So what more can you ask of a move? And Prague, he's thinking, uh, obviously, he can take on C6 and take on B8. And I don't think Magnus would turn down a draw for, but we've talked about it. You know, someone who's defeated Magnus five times uh, in across the time controls doesn't do that by just immediately saying, oh, okay, you equalize, let me acquiesce to the draw. He's got the white pieces, and before yielding that half point, he's really going to plumb the depths of the position and make sure that there aren't any ways uh, to keep the pressure up. But it feels like Magnus Carlsen has solved the worst of his problems here. For sure, yes. Uh, bishop on c6, the desired square. <clears throat> White is unable to benefit anything immediately, which means that the battle for the d5 square has been neutralized. Yeah, basically, black has won the battle because uh, the d5 square was in white's control. And if black wins the battle, it means that he will equalize. The big question, yes, and Prague captures on d8. Mm -hmm. The queens have to be traded. Uh, however, the, the big decision is only postponed after look, f takes d8, which is already on the board. There is a big question. If you don't trade on c6, then black wants to damage your pawn structure and also wants to go d6, d5. So there are all arguments to be seeing your exact line that knight and game like bishop takes c6 yeah, on the board. Mm -hmm. b takes c6. Okay, rook takes b8 and rook b1 is uh, that entry point to the knight end game we were discussing. But again, rook takes b8, not forced. You know, you could play a4, but it, I'm getting the vibe that Prague is, you know, making a beeline for that variation. But I mean, a4, you, there's a case to be made for this move because, you know, you can delay rook takes b8 and rook b1 until a more opportune moment. Of course, here you're giving black the option of keeping all of the rooks on the board. Black could play rook a8, and I think that move would be very likely, restricting, uh, stopping the further progress of white's pawn. And if you play rook b6, I was thinking maybe knight d5 is an elegant way to potentially even just force a draw straight away after rook takes c6, or after the trade on d5, it feels like black can just pile up on that a pawn. Rook a1, rook a5 doesn't seem to me like Magnus is, uh, or, or would be in any kind of danger here. Black just has this idea of walking the king to e7 to defend the only weak pawn and then doubling on the a file and fully restricting that pawn. Yeah, it looks very drawish in general, this, this end game. The reason why I'm believing that the move a4 could easily happen is the fact that the knight end game is kind of a little bit tricky and it's tricky for both sides. So whoever this, whoever needs to decide on is in a very tricky spot. The reason why I'm saying that it's very tricky, let's just quickly before we have action talk about this end game. Takes takes rook b1. So clearly, if we are giving up the b5, we want to follow it up with rook b1. So takes takes. And yes, white does have a passer. On the other hand, black has very powerful central control. So black will play king f8, d5, king e7, king d6. Clearly, the a pawn is not fast enough to, to queen before black's king is uh, running towards the, the queen side. So let's, of course, start with king f8. And how does white get his king into play? King f1, king e1, king d2 looks, looks slightly passive. Yeah, black follows up with all these moves and eventually starts progressing his pawns on the queen side, has a space advantage. I'm just knowing also that the, this is the World, World Cup Finals. So much at stake. The position is roughly balanced. Also, this endgame should be balanced, but it does not really give winning chances. Then why do I have to go into speculation like this? Let me be more professional. That's the argument I'm getting for a move like A4. 
Yeah, very well reasoned. And, you know, that night end game, the common wisdom uh, asserts that night end games are most similar to pawn end games. And the funny thing is, uh, if you were to remove the knights from the board, normally any pawn end game with an outside pass pawn like this, that's a pass pawn which is removed uh, from all of the other pawns is like automatically winning. But because of Black's compact pawn structure, I'm not even sure that that uh, is the case, uh, funnily enough. And maybe it is winning. But if you think about it, you know, Black will very quickly get his king over to the king side. He'll set up this pawn wall with the pawns on d5 and c5. And how is white going to break through? In fact, in some situations, white could end up even in some sort of a zugzwang because of his inferior king position. So all of this is to show that this isn't just a bailout option. This is not a risk-free option for Prague. And this has to be carefully evaluated. When you're playing Magnus, Peter, I think it should be emphasized that Anytime the queens are off the board, you're feeling a, a little bit of a pang of fear because Magnus has this reputation as perhaps the definitely top three endgame player of all time. I think I would make a case that he is the best endgame player of all time thus far. So all of your fears are amplified. I think Prague is doing a great job of spending his time here, not just instantly making a decision. And A4 might be the wiser choice here. Yes, now also I'm trying to gasp uh, the, the psychological situation, yeah, that Magnus was under pressure. He might feel like this is the best position so far in his game. Uh, he has equalized, definitely has equalized. The A pawn doesn't look so frightening. We do know the, the famous general wisdom that rook, uh, rooks behind a pass pawn are dream scenarios. But in this certain uh, structure, exactly because of this, very special uh, central pawn formation from black side. One would argue that, just to highlight something like this, okay, it can also happen after a4, that what if black is not even now uh, immediately going for rook 8, but just starts bringing his king and tries to play a psychological game? Yeah, please show me how many useful moves you have. I have king d5, taking up my mind if I will trade rooks or not. The A pawn doesn't seem very dangerous, and we have development. Okay, and it's not quite A4, it's King G2. So an even more flexible move by Prague as he just keeps all of his options open. He keeps the A4 square open. Is it because he wants to put a knight there in the event that Black plays the move D65, trying to get the knight to C5? What do you make of this uh, interesting development here? Yes, it's certainly interesting. I also believe that somehow Prague wants to indicate that he's ready to fight for the center. Eventually, something like F for King FC and Magnus opted for the move to K8. He wants to clarify the situation as quickly as possible. He's going after the A pawn, also inviting Rook B6. Indeed. Putting some pressure on Prague and on his clock here. 31 minutes, but that feels like a lot of time given the relative simplicity of this endgame. I'd be a lot more worried for Prague if you still had, you know, the type of middle game position that we came from, feels like White can go Rook FC1 or A4, and the price of a move isn't that high for White. It really feels like Prague uh, isn't really at risk of digging himself into a hole here. I have the same feeling, yes, that, okay, White is uh, certainly in control. Black is very much in control as well. I somehow sense that both players are incredible fighters. None of them wants to offer a draw. But mm -hmm. given the situation and also understanding, showing respect towards the opponent that my opponent has played excellent chess, there is a temptation to find a way, you know, a logical way of kind of uh, getting some elegant kind of draw. Like you showed this line beautifully, rook b6, knight d5, inviting rook takes c6, knight takes c3, rook takes c3. Rook takes a2, which would suddenly leave a position completely drawn. And none of the sides would need to offer a draw. It's enough just to look at each other and you know that yes. shake hands <laughs> is, the, is the right way forward. Yeah, I, I've told this story several times on stream, but it's so pertinent. Uh, I played a tournament uh, a couple of years ago on the island of Corsica in France. Beautiful place. And uh, back then, uh, this was a pretty unusual rule. You couldn't offer draws in this tournament at all. I mean, now that's uh, pretty normal. But back then, I think it was one of the only tournaments that had that requirement. 
and I was playing Etienne Bacro, the the French uh, French super grandmaster. We went into some sort of opposite colored bishop end game. That's a dead draw, and the you could still offer a draw. You know, humans are very good at adapting. So the way the draws would be offered in the, that tournament is you would just look at each other and you would smile at each other, and then you would sort of pointedly start repeating the moves. I would play bishop b7 to a8, and he played bishop b2 to a1. I played bishop a8 to b7. So there would be ways around it, but you're right. Both of these players, they are fighters. Prague, uh, that's what makes him so fun to watch. He he almost never plays for a draw. He he plays for the win, but I think in this case, the position is going to start bailing out very shortly. And rook b6 is on the board. Will we see knight d5? Will we see a draw in the next couple of moves? Or will Magnus defend with rook dc8? Is he flirting with the idea of playing for a win here? Yes, uh, I think that uh, the next move will be telling. Yeah, that uh, if Magnus has any intentions with this game, then he's going to play rook d8 to c8. However, sensing that <laughs> the position is anyway completely equal, it's not like black is, you know, willing to take risk in order to maximize his winning chances. One could give the case that, yeah, Magnus first just dupes the board. <laughs> uh, correct. Yeah. I, I like wiping, this approach. Yeah. yeah, wiping away an invisible particle off the uh, A3 square, I think. Yes, so rook b6, rook dc8, or knight d5. There is also a case to be made for d6, d5. That's also a liquidation idea. Rook takes c6, d4, yes, we sacrifice the pawn on c6, but we force the knight to move from c3. The pawn on a2 is hanging. It could be also a tempting option. Maybe Magnus, maybe Magnus can convince himself to to try this because he does get a little, at least a uh, little space advantage in the center. Yeah, this could get a little bit of spite. Could get a little spicy, uh, and not in a pleasant way for White if that e2 pawn uh, ends up under fire. So Magnus could just say, "Listen, I've been under pressure this whole game. I have this essentially forced draw with knight d5. Let's just go home." I've got the white pieces tomorrow, but you know the Magnus that we're used to is someone who tries to maximize his opportunities. And if he realistically feels that Prague is losing the thread here a little bit, maybe relaxing uh, prematurely, then we will see d5 or rook dc8. So very interesting decision to be made for Magnus Carlsen here and a good opportunity for us to go on another short break. But before we do that, we wanted to remind uh, the chess fans among you, that means all of you, all 100,000 plus of you to mark your calendars for Chess Clash, the greatest chess and Clash universe crossover you did not know you needed. We're teaming up with Supercell to bring your favorite creators together for an epic series of Chess and Clash challenges. It's a star-studded lineup as Alexander Botez, Gotham Chess, Clash with Ash, Sapnap, who played in Pog Champs, and more. Battle it out in the Ultimate Strategy Game Competition which clan will prevail? Well, to find out, tune into Chess Clash on September the 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific. Use exclam clash, exclamation mark clash in chat to learn more. And we will be back with that with more action from Carlson Pragnananda here in the first match game of the 2023 World Cup. Stay tuned. We are live in Oslo, Norway. It's a beautiful day, a beautiful summer. You know the drill, we've done this before. Ma'am, do you mind if I ask you some questions real quick? When I say chess, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Game, puzzle. Puzzle, that's brilliant. Chess, horse. Smart. Black and white. <laughs> Black and white. That's two words, but I'm gonna let it pass. If I say chess, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Um. I, I don't know if I have any other questions for you. Okay, when I say strategy, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Puzzle. Puzzle, oh my God, Magnus Carlsen. Chess. The answer was puzzle, actually. That was the correct answer. That's okay, though, okay. Yeah, I love chess. You do love chess. Yeah. Where, do you play chess? Yeah, sometimes. You, you play chess online? Yeah. Where do you play? Uh, chess.com, of course. You play on chess.com, yeah. of course. Do you know who Magnus Carlsen is? Uh, no. Okay, could you name any world chess champion? We sure not. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Obviously, you know who Magnus Carlsen is. Sure. Right? He's a um, hero. You know how good he is? The best? Yeah, he's he's the best, right? <laughs> yeah. Has, has Norway changed now that Magnus isn't the world champion? Yeah, it's kind of a bit more sad. Why? Yeah. Do you know that he's no longer the world chess champion? 
I did not know that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you didn't know why you felt sad, and now you know why. Yeah, I guess so he'll he'll get back up. He'll there. get back. Do you know why? No. He left chess to become a footballer. Actually. Yeah. Actually. I think it's very different chess and football. Yeah. But he's an athlete, so he can pull it off. It makes sense. It makes sense, right? I don't know who he is. You don't know who Magnus Carlsen no. is? Okay. <laughs> He's a professional footballer, one of the most well-known in Norway. Okay, okay. Okay, so. He... Sorry, I'm not from here. Okay. I heard there was a huge um, chess tournament thing where he accused another player of cheating. That's true. Do you know anything about that scandal? Have we done our job, Oslo? Oslo, they are an educated chess city, a city of deep-thinking people, a city of beautiful people, a city where chess comes to life. Folks, we are back at the 2023 World Cup sooner than expected. Uh, Peter is still taking his much-deserved break. He's coming back right now, but we have to go back live because we have had a massive development in the Caruana Abbasov game. This is our third place match. Uh, Peter, we came back sooner than expected because Fabiano Caruana has just made a fatal blunder, an insane blunder. And uh, I'm still in shock at what we just saw during the break with Caruana's move queen to b4. So two moves ago, we thought that things were going on the upswing for black. Abbasov seemed to be losing the thread of the game. We were discussing the move f5, which would have given black great defensive chances. But instead, after a 22-minute think, Caruana goes on the other side. He plays queen to b4, trying to attack white's pawn center laterally and completely forgetting, seemingly, about the dangers inherent on the king's side. Bishop takes h7, king takes h7, and the decisive move knight e4, and the threats of knight g5, and in some cases knight f6, that means the game is essentially over here. Wow, I mean, uh, first of all, let's just very quickly understand what happens after queen takes d4, seemingly loses on the spot due to, well, due to multiple reasons, knight f6 check is, is, is just the human easy way, and Fabi did make a move, Oh my gosh. After... Queen e7, f5, knight f6, and queen takes h6. We have to show that line. Queen e7, he retreats. Oh my gosh. Yes. Wow, f5. Oh. oh my gosh. Beautiful. Knight f6 check, and you pre move queen takes h6. Wow. Gorgeous. Stunning, stunning checkmate, and probably Fabi in a state of shock 
Yeah, that how did I not have foreseen sense the danger? Uh, after Queen E7, the position it's not only because of this uh, uh, sensational tactic looks dangerous. I mean, there are so many ideas, just knight g5, check rook h3, and eventually preparing some devastating sacrifice on h6. One can simply feel that this position should be lost for black. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, oh my gosh. We should also show two more things, Peter. After f5, e takes f5, knight f6. You might say, well, okay, I see that I can't take the knight. Let's drop the king back and give up the exchange. No, I still take on h6, and there's an Arabian mate uh, that's equally beautiful at the end of that line. So that's the first thing. But I actually think Fabi saw that and is intending uh, to meet f5 with knight to d5, right? Trying to cover the f6 square. But white can now play not knight f6, but first of all, there's knight g5 check. But even pawn f6, I think, is a very simple move. If you play gf, you run into the same tactic with queen takes h6. And if you play queen f8, I think this is actually a very important position after queen f8. Uh, because, you well, you can go rook takes g7. Check. Oh, yeah, you can just go rook g7 and f takes g7. You don't even need uh, the fancy knight g5 check. Just rook takes g7, rook takes g7. And, oh, queen takes g7. There is f takes g7. Oh, my gosh. And knight takes e3, yes. knight f6, mate. I mean, how many lovely patterns do we have in this one position involving the knight coming to f6? Yeah, and it all because of one mistake, this uh, queen e7 to b4, losing the tempo. I think the, the, the reason things escalated here very quickly, the, the reason why Fabi uh, missed this whole scenario, I think was truly uh, psychological, that his terrible looking knight on h7 seemingly doing nothing. You would think like white has played the move bishop e4, so white is maybe trying to set up some battery on the b1 h7 diagonal trying to checkmate black there and you don't think suddenly yeah you can have this hallucination that you just don't think that this monster bishop from e4 will be traded for that uh, terrible looking knight on h7 but it did happen and after knight e4 queen e7 on the board abasov has already made his move f5 on the board and these patterns are, this is third grade for someone like Nichada Boss. I mean, I mean, this is puzzle rush basics with queen takes h6. It doesn't take away from the beauty of this line, but Nichada Boss will see this while skydiving in his sleep. Uh, he doesn't even need the 42 minutes that he has on his clock. This, these lines are so easy to calculate. I think Fabiano Caruana will stop the clock like right here. He might stop the clock after knight d5, f6, but this game is not going to last more than a couple more moves. Incredible. Yeah, shocking development. He's resigned. Yeah. And resigned. Wow. What oh, a win by Nija Tavasov. Stunning. R really, really, really stunning. I think Fabi cannot believe what happened. It's it's clear the tiredness, everything together. He was just not not able to to think with a quiet head, with a calm head, which was actually required for this semifinal. I mean not semifinals, uh for third place match. It's not Shakriar Mamedyarov, the top seed from Azerbaijan. It's not Ralph Mamedov, the experienced grandmaster. It's Nijad Abbasov, the hometown hero who goes the furthest in the World Cup, and his legendary run continues. And after losing to Magnus Carlsen, he bounces back. Excellent opening preparation to get an exciting and enterprising position, and then phenomenal tactical vision to finish off Fabi in only 26 moves. And that means we have to go back to our other game because Magnus Carlsen has made the big decision of keeping the tension with Rook FC8. That does not mean that the game is not going to end in a quick draw, but at least it keeps some intrigue alive in this position. Yes, so let's take a look. Rook B6 was met by Rook D8, Rook C1, very natural e5 and rook c2 so white basically sets up a very nice defensive idea the rook protects the pawn on a2 the rook also indirectly eyes the c6 weakness yes one could argue that knight d7 kicking away that rook is the most natural move but then white starts kicking that black knight for example knight d7 rook b7 knight c5 rook b6 
would yeah i wanted to ask would that be kind of a draw offer silent draw offer but black can maybe fall back with the knight to e6 and just don't give three moves to magnus if magnus gets his king to the center then he will feel like i might have something to play with yeah and this is what's so hard to do psychologically you've been under pressure the whole game the sweet nectar of the draw is beckoning it's calling your name an early dinner you know the white pieces the next day but you know magnus wouldn't be magnus unless he possessed that sort of just fighting spirit in any situation the moment he sees even an iota of an opportunity to keep the game going to keep the fire in the end game burning he will go for it but i like Prague's move i think rook c2 is a careful move it's a cautious move and uh, one way or the other i think a repetition or a bailout is most likely but there's a tiny opportunity here for magnus maybe uh, to keep to keep some embers burning, shall we say? Certainly, it's uh, basically this type of positions that Magnus knows that uh, all I have to do find a couple of nice, useful little moves that keep the game going, that keep the tension, and uh, basically my opponent can get nervous. Yeah, often you collect the point finally based on your opponent's mistake. Yeah, you just can't win a chess game. Uh, based on your strengths only. Yeah? However, the moves together can bring the effect on your opponent to get nervous, uh, do something that you don't want. I do believe that also white, actually Prague is setting up a beautiful regrouping. Knight b1, knight d2, knight bc. That would give perfect harmony to white's uh, pieces and probably the reason why also black has to start with knight d7, kicking that look away from b6 as quickly as possible before white starts to ask some question on the c6 pawn. Indeed. That is a, a lovely knight maneuver uh, to, to get a hold of some key squares on the queen side. Body language, you know, again, I, I try, uh, I've learned my lesson as a commentator. You just never know what a player is truly thinking. And sometimes uh, speculating can have the opposite effect. But it, I just, I don't feel like Magnus is going to burn all of his bridges. I think he's going to search for a, a suitably risk-free option to keep the game going. But in the absence of that, I think he sees the repetition with knight c7 and knight c5. Um, can he force things with a move like d4? Probably not. And for the reason that you mentioned, because of knight d1 and the e5 pawn becomes weaker uh, as a result. Maybe even knight b1 uh, is, is a better way to, to maneuver the knight later onto d2. I was thinking knight d5 here uh, as an idea, but... Well, I guess this is also a draw, right? Rook takes c6, rook takes, rook takes, rook takes a2. But there is this move, rook c5, and that is the reason why I think this is quite unpleasant. And how the engine indicates the absolutely <laughs> ridiculous knight to e3 check as the only way to keep an objective draw on the board. That's where I stop. That's where my job ends because I don't understand anything about this game that we love anymore. Well, if we see already, thanks to computer, the move, then we can <laughs> uh, try to understand. Yeah, it's uh, kind of clear that f takes e3, rook takes e2, check is uh, black collects a bunch of pawns. The pawn on d3 will be vulnerable. White's knight is still uh, very, uh, very out of game. Somehow the, the knight on b1 doesn't feel comfortable, but there's this little human touch king fc like all right mr computer yeah you are jumping you are very creative you are fantastic but what do you have in store for us after king fc and the computer says yes i'm a computer i can play e5 e4 check i mean my mind is exploding or knight is to c2 and try some rookie one and maybe also tries to trap that knight on uh, b1 insane stuff yeah magnus goes for knight d7 thank you magnus helping us out in this craziness. <laughs> Indeed, keeping the position sane. And we are approaching a big moment uh, where Magnus likely after rook b7, knight c5, I don't think Prague is going to protest too much. I think he'll repeat quickly with rook b6. And then the moment of truth. Will we see this knight e6 move? Uh, will he keep the fire burning? Or will he opt for repetition with rook b7? And, uh, you know, an auxiliary question, will White's time situation influence his decision? Because 22 minutes for Prague, we have seen how Carlsen poses problems out of nowhere, uh, how he creates, you know, these issues where you think there are none. What do you think, Peter? Like, if we see Rook B7, which, by the way, is not a guarantee. Like, Prague could play Rook B4. 
And that's a completely viable move. But should he go for that repetition? Will we see 96? Almost impossible to predict, honestly. Well, I would go as far as to say that maybe not so difficult to assess. Uh, Magnus will go for it and Prague senses it. I think the reason why he's not blitzing out rook b7 is not because of his uh, thinking about repetition or whatever. He knows exactly that if you give Magnus a chance and you let him activate that knight, that knight might be able to jump to d4, dislocating that beautiful rook on uh, rook from c2. Black will also start marching with his king. We'll have a very easy game. On the other hand, if that knight is to be stuck on d7, then the whole situation is completely different. I somehow feel that uh, Prague is taking his time. He might be opting for, for, for rook b4 choice. Yeah, rook b4. Black could still respond with knight c5, but it no longer comes with tempo. And white could use this tempo to do one of several things. White could push uh, a4, for example, and be better equipped to respond to knight e6. It just doesn't feel like knight e6 comes with the same effect uh, once this pawn reaches a more well-defended square. White gets a little bit more breathing room for his rook on c2, which could slide over to a2 in some situations. Doesn't feel like white is in a lot of danger here, but we are about to find out which approach Prague will take here. Rook b7, very tempting because it's a forcing move. Yes, it's a forcing move. But you also feel like you are inviting Magnus to get this knight c5, knight e6 construction. That's uh, mm -hmm. what I don't like. And Magnus already has earned himself the reputation Yeah, that uh, people know exactly. You give me the tiniest of tiny things and I will make the most out of it. Prague is not really interested of, of giving him. The big question, however, now that Magnus stabilized his pawn structure, that is White able to change the character of the game? So, for example, let's say rook b4. Even if we don't do anything, we just start bringing that king into the center via f8, e7, d6. How is White progressing? Yeah, he has a break with f4, but even after f4, I don't have to react. I might just play a move like f6. Say so like, you know what? Okay, you want to trade on e5? Uh, please trade. It's not obvious who benefits. Black might also get a lovely f6 square later for his knight with king on d6, knight f6. Some weaknesses in white's camp. It, uh, it, it could get tricky. I mean, especially because we talk about Magnus Carlsen sitting on the black side. Yeah, it really, it felt like the moment that Carlsen rectified his pawn structure uh, after the... Uh, bishops got traded on c6. It almost felt like there was a bit of a turning point because white's queenside pressure was canceled out and, you know, Prague traded it in for a pass pawn on a2, and that's a major asset, but that pawn isn't going to reach uh, a5 anytime soon. It can move up to a4 pretty easily, but, you know, then you start getting the question, well, is that pawn a strength or is it a liability? Because white does have to devote a lot of manpower to keep that pawn protected. So... You know, Prague senses it, and it's clear that he senses it because he's taking his time. I think if he thought that this was an easy draw, he would play rook b7, and there we go. He opts for a more modest retreating move, rook to b1, and will we see a quick king f8? I think that would be very on brand for Magnus to respond quickly with a kind of open ended move like king f8, which you pointed out. Yes, uh, after rook b1, it's very tempting. You know exactly that somehow. Is, is Prague maybe trying to set up something on the c5 with a quick rook bc1 before black's king reaches uh, the center and protects the d5 square? Let's just highlight king f8, rook bc1, a human weight setting knight takes d5, uh -huh. making good use of the pin. And how is black reacting? If the knight defends, then thank you very much that uh, flexible knight from d7 moved. And if you play something like rook e5, we might be in time for this knight d1, knight b1, knight d2, knight b3 maneuver. Oh, that's a lovely defensive idea. So if you play knight d1, okay, so which, let's say knight d1. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I faked you out, Peter. Uh, yes. Knight d1, knight, <laughs> okay, so first of all, if black plays c5, that's a very instructive positional mistake because you weaken the d5 pawn, white can play knight e3, and this plays right into white's hands. You potentially get that c4 outpost for your knight. So if black wants to lose, that's the best way to do it. Um, and we see a move by Magnus. I'm going to interrupt my explanation here, and it is knight c5. 
and it is knight c5. And my question is, what if rook bc1? What if Prague follows up on his idea? Yes, yeah, certainly he will, I guess. Then Magnus certainly rook relies a5. on the rook a5. Yes, actually, we have to show it because it's so beautiful. White is now uh, eyeing the knight on c5. Yes, yeah, so knight takes d5 is a threat. And after rook a5, seemingly white has only defended that knight once with the rook on a5. But after knight d5, c5, the other rook joins the party from c8, making sure that the knight is guarded so the tactic does not work. Lovely. So white would have to drop back the knight uh, to d1. And I think this actually forces the bailout on the draw. Knight d1, knight e6. Rook takes c6. And, you know, everybody sees where this is going. You trade on c6. You take on a2. And actually, a very important yes. detail. Knight c3, <laughs> rook c2. Looks like White's dug himself into a bit of a hole. But no, knight takes d5. And the tactics work out for both sides. Can't take on c6, but you can take on e2. And likely will. And likely will accompany that with a draw for, I think we're going to go right barreling down that variation yeah it also shows that what a nice little touch rook b1 was yeah it's a perfect judgment by prague we did talk about this that he cannot uh, allow a sign of weakness that he is unsure or just blitzes out some moves carelessly and lets magnus build up his position and then get the chance of uh, squeezing out something out of uh, seemingly nothing rook b1 Followed by rook bc1 idea, you really need clarity, clear idea, clear vision, how you neutralize things like this. This is honestly a lovely moment that's so easy to miss, right? You look at the game uh, after the fact, all of the moves seem pretty obvious, but what's not going to be mentioned, what's behind the scenes, is the fact that Prague paused, right? He paused in this moment after knight d7, and we've been talking about it all stream, the maturity, the universality that Prague has displayed uh, in this tournament. And this is part of that. He knows when to pause, when to say, wait a second, I'm starting to lose the thread a little bit. Let me hunker down and find the most precise defense so that Magnus isn't allowed to be Magnus. Uh, and he finds this rook b1, rook c1 idea, which uh, I think was perhaps the only way to, to actually force a bailout and to force the exchange of the c pawn for the a pawn. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, if. Uh... Not for this doubling on the B file. That was my concern. Yeah, that there were no clear uh, directions for White being able to shut down Black's wheel of just continuing bringing his king to the center and starts to play on the nerves of the defender. No, Prague does not want to be a defender. He feels that okay, uh, the position should be equal. Let me find the right way. And Rook B1. Sometimes the retreating moves are the most difficult, and we did speculate about will Prague go for repetition or will he retreat the rook to b4 it just shows that how deep Prague is we haven't even called out his move rook b1 but it was fantastic awesome defensive move rook b1 rook c1 that's a maneuver straight into the defensive textbook and rook a5 of course magnus will not uh, miss this move I don't think Prague will waste a lot of time here. We will He will drop his knight either to d1 or to b1. It ultimately leads to the same position because the knight will redeploy over to c3. I feel like we're in the final stages of this excellently played game. Yes, somehow humanly, I believe that the knight b1 move is so much more natural because after knight b1, you feel that you want to go knight d2. While after knight d1, I'm not exactly sure where is this knight heading. Yes, we do see that uh, it won't be an important question. Because everything will go down to a forced trading line. But still, humanly speaking, knight b1 looks so much more natural. Agreed. Agreed completely. Prague, again, such poise. He takes his time. He never rushes into anything. And uh, when you're playing Magnus Carlsen, you really do need to triple check every one of your options. Also, that uh, Prague feels that everything... If everything goes according to plans, the, the way that he calculates and everything is right, then it does not really matter how much time he has on the clock. What is important that he takes the right decision, he makes the right move and takes it from there. Indeed. 16 minutes on the clock for Pragnananda. We are 25 minutes into this first match game of the World Cup final. And what a rich game. 
uh, it's it's turned out to be, right? You can look at it with holding down the arrow key and you can think, oh, all the pieces got traded. It was a symmetrical pawn structure. Mm -hmm. But you could divide this game into so many different stages, right? There was the opening stage where both players showed some interesting preparation. Knight f6 from Carlsen, b4 from Prague. There was that rich middle game with all of those complications between bishop d7 and bishop h3. And then uh, a very interesting end game where suddenly, you know, Prague is the one who has to solve a defensive problem. And uh, he's got the final problem to solve. He has to see, Peter, that knight takes d5 idea. When we play it on the board, it's very obvious. But if he doesn't see that move, then he likely won't go for knight d1. But with all the time he's got on his clock, there's no way that he's missing that tactic. For sure, yes. I mean, I mean, it's a forced line. Everything has to go along these lines. You do understand that you have to activate your pieces. You can't stay, yeah, we have action. Knight b1 on the board. Yep, and there we go. We're uh, going straight down that line, rook takes. Uh, C6 is going to follow. And who will be the one doing the honors? Who will be offering the draw? Hard to say. Hard to say if anybody will offer the draw. They might just keep playing that endgame. But the way yes. Carlson is looking to the side, Peter, it feels like he might be contemplating a, uh, a peace, peace offering here pretty shortly. I don't think that he, he, he will offer a draw, but it's more like the position will be dead. Yeah, and... Uh, we already talked about it. It's it's a match situation. You don't want to show any sign of weakness by uh, signaling your opponent that you are interested in a draw. But if the game gets done to a completely dead draw, then both players know exactly that, okay, that's it. No, no one needs to offer a draw. We, we just shake hands together. <laughs> Indeed. And you might be wondering why Prague is thinking. It turns out that rook takes c6 is not the only move, strictly speaking. You could complete the maneuver with knight d2. And that is based on an interesting tactic. Knight d2, knight d4 looks devastating, but white actually plays knight to b3 and forces the knights off the board. Here, I think white is actually slightly better uh, because of the weakness of the c6 pawn. Uh, so the fact that Prague is taking his time tells me that, okay, he probably saw rook take c6 quickly. Is he maybe thinking with a corner of his mind about keeping things alive with knight t2. I really don't think so, but should be pointed out, that move exists. Yes, uh, and a very good point. We did talk about the fact that if white in this structure lands a knight on b3, that gives white perfect harmony, stability. We won't be able to talk about those kind of things that we talked before, that maybe black gets the upper hand or psychologically it will be difficult to play with white. Uh, then white will have perfect uh, peace coordination. Mm -hmm. All eyes on Prague. He's about to make a move, and he goes for it. Knight d2 on the board. Wow. Okay, so this game uh, going to last a little bit longer than we thought. Knight d2. Is it because he wants to keep chances alive, or is it because there was something about rook takes c6 that uh, might have worried him? I think it's actually the latter um, because after the exchange, Peter, White would have been left with that weak pawn on d3. I think we should show this line for full context, right? Takes, takes, rook a2, knight c3, rook c2, knight c5, rook takes c2, and yes, it's a draw, but you've got that weak pawn on d3, Black's got the outpost on d4. I feel like White has to make a couple more accurate moves here. So from that perspective, I actually really like Prague's decision to play knight d2, but... 13 minutes, uh, 13 moves to play, 14 minutes to do it in. He's got to trade carefully. And Magnus has almost instantly replied with the move rook c8 to a8. He did look a little bit at the side, uh, just probably digesting the fact that, aha, wow, I mean, my opponent is not taking on c6. He has the guts to play knight d2. It, from, from my feeling, this is what I got. And then he, he opted for this very professional move, rook c8 to a8, trying to trade off the c6 pawn for the a2 pawn. Indeed. And still a little bit of work here to do, because if you play rook takes c6, rook takes a2, and then carelessly drop the rook back to c2, knight d4. And suddenly you're faced with a fresh set of challenges. Still probably a draw somehow if you play carefully, but... This is how Magnus starts to sow the seeds of fear in his opponent's mind, right? Imagine having this position with eight minutes on the clock. Prague, 
has to stay very composed here. And he has to avoid a situation where Magnus feels like he can start putting practical pressure. I like the move knight f3, um, either before or after rook takes c6. It is the most accurate move according to the engine. Start by removing the knight from the line of fire of black's rooks and then take on c6. Yeah, if uh, if already knight f3, somehow I, I like it instantly the most mm -hmm. because it also puts some pressure on black. It's it's clear that he can't be hanging on to his e5 pawn f6 would give white the chance of capturing on c6 by hitting the and on the board knight f3 beautiful Excellent. play by Prague. Just I mean he is playing this like Capablanca, just an endgame veteran, so composed, and that is the most accurate move. Uh, we wanted to shout out also 110,000 plus watching on YouTube, folks. We really appreciate uh, all of this support uh, and energy. Classical Chess is alive and well. Uh, the fan bases for these two players are alive and well. Uh, but uh, winning chances for either side are not really alive and well. We are heading in the direction of a draw on the strength of Prague's ultra-accurate sequence of moves here. Knight d2 and now knight f3. And after e4... I think we're going to start to bail out. The trade on e4, Prague might retreat to d2, and one way or the other, I think the c pawn will get traded for the a pawn. Very likely outcome. There is even some case for a move like knight e5, but uh, just because of the importance of the situation, the match, you don't want to do anything fancy in a position like this. One really has the feeling that we have seen enough action adventures already. You have to play according to demand of the position. And if you see that d takes e4, d takes e4, knight d2, knight d4. Okay, let's even put it on the board. Sure. It's kind of a forcing sequence. Then white follows it up with rook c4. And what do we make out of this? It, it looks like knight, knight takes e2. e2. Can we play rook e1? Oh, yes, I think we can. Rook takes e2. I mean, should I black's knight is trapped. But tactically, black wins back the knight on d2. And actually, it's Prague who would have to be careful should this position be reached. Because you can't win both of black's pawns at the same time. You'd have to opt for a four on three, which is exactly what you don't want. Even if it's a relatively easy draw with a pawn on e4, kind of sticking out like a sore thumb. Instead of rookie one, white should probably opt for the careful rook c2, uh, defending the a2 pawn. And after rook takes a2, um, after the trade on a2, white picks up the e4 pawn, and technically black is up a pawn, but that c6 pawn will not be sustainable because the knight on e2 cannot be abandoned by black's rook. And Prague is about, I think, to take that pawn on e4. Would be the logical move. But hasn't yet made his move, and he's down to 11 minutes. And move 28. Okay, still 12 moves to play till the time control. And the lines that we showed still consist some spice. For sure. Much easier when you've got the eval bar. Prague, of course, is so aware that you make one little misstep and you've got 10 minutes and Magnus starts putting pressure. You cannot afford to make an inaccuracy here if you're white. Yes, so there is even this argument of eventually going 95, but it's too speculative. Yeah, I mean, trade on t3 and black plays c5, Peter. And again, you might get into that scenario where white ends up with a, pa with a weak pawn on d3. And this is, you know, everything's a draw here, right? Objectively, all of these lines end in zeros, but you don't want to end up with a long-term weakness like that. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, you, you feel like the game is about to end. You don't want to get yourself into any kind of trouble, even if it's the, the smallest. You just want clarity. You just want to make sure that no surprises are awaiting you. Well, we have a surprise awaiting us. Uh, we have the winner of the third place match, the first match game. Grandmaster Nijada Basov, the hometown hero, is in the studio. We're going to keep an eye on the Magnus game, so don't worry, folks. Uh, we will. Uh, keep you updated on the moves, but we have Nijat uh, in the studio to 
uh, help us decode the rest of that game and comment on his own sparkling brilliance. Inijat, thank you so much. You must be exhausted, but we appreciate you joining us in the studio. How are you feeling after this brilliant first match game victory? Uh, well, that's true. I mean, the tournament is pretty exhausting. I mean, we started, uh, I mean, I started even with the first round so when it I mean, it was July when we played and it's already August 22. It's been more than uh, half a month I'm playing chess and it's quite tiring, uh, but it's tiring for everyone. And Fabi had uh, quite a roller coaster yesterday. Um, you know, this tie break was uh, quite energy consuming and I guess he was simply uh, not uh, physically ready to play today and especially I opted uh, some new opening uh, that I didn't play in this tournament which came as a surprise maybe for him and uh, then yeah he let me control the g file have nice center and uh, especially this queen before I think was a decisive mistake for him and after that after that uh, I just had crushing attack what was your reaction Nijat? after caruana plays queen before is it like an immediate rush of excitement uh when was the exact moment that you realized the game was over is that when you spotted that queen takes h6 idea by the way we are seeing e3 by magnus this game is about to be over uh as the e3 pawn is going to be captured so i think we're going to get likely a draw for here but what was the moment you realized the game was over well, I guess, um, I mean, when I played bishop e4, I was expecting from him either f5 or g6. And uh, of course, I also considered different moves like knight c4, knight d5, queen b4, but uh, all of them would be looking suspicious to me, especially queen b4, because I couldn't see how to parry my, you know, mating attack after bishop h7, knight d4. I don't know what he overlooked because it was pretty straightforward that after knight e4, I have the ideas with uh, f5, queen takes h6, or knight g5 check. And basically, immediately he played queen before I realized that uh, I should be winning. And yeah. Nishat, let me also congratulate you on this, first of all, wonderful World Cup and your sensational victory today. And we do have a question from the audience. Do you feel playing in your home country and the presence of the crowd improve your play? How much energy are you getting from playing so fantastically at Baku? Well, I don't know if you heard of that or not. Like uh, in my game, in the first game against Magnus, uh, about 1,000 spectators came to the match to watch it live. I mean, it's a not not a football match, not a not a tennis match. It's a chess game, and uh, so many spectators I have never seen in my life uh, in a chess tournament. And imagine they all support you, and uh, it definitely uh, gives you motivation and energy. Like despite I've been playing for already twenty three days, or I don't know how long, but uh, this support I see, I feel. Uh, gives me, you know, this needed energy to keep fighting and, uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Nijat. Um, great insights. Congratulations. We will let you rest. We just had a handshake in the Magnus game. Obviously, as expected, that game ends in a draw. Nijat, we will let you go. Uh, best of luck thank on you your game, uh, second game tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. And there we have it. The bailout, a 35-move draw in our championship game. What a well-played game. Prognananda with some filigree precision in the end game as they discuss the position. Really impressive, Peter. I think that just the precision with which Prognananda handled that final part of the game, it started to feel like Magnus might be putting some pressure. But at the end of the day, a very balanced, well-played affair, lasting just about three hours. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, th this is what I love about uh, classical chess. And also I feel like it's the duty of the commentators yeah, to explain this kind of games. There was so much intrigue. There was so much tension involved. All these little nuances, these details, which if one shows some weakness, the other one is ready to jump on and put up the torture for a very long time. 
None of the players gave the slightest of chances to their opponents. Prague did have the initiative. Magnus Dan with some incredible precise play in the middle game. This rook b8, bishop d7, bishop c6, just neutralizing everything. Then Prague with this rook b1, uh, uh, retreat with the rook. Sensational stuff. It's an honor to be commenting games like this. It really is. I mean, we have courtside seats to some of the best played classical chess that we've seen in a couple of years. It was so awesome to see the heart, the passion with which both these players played. Of course, for Magnus, a gold hold with the black pieces, but big hats off to Prague, who is in one of the most high pressure situations, hundreds of thousands of people watching, and he handles himself like someone with a decade plus of super tournament experience. Uh, just such an easy young man to root for. Uh, Prague is awesome, and uh, he has a very difficult task ahead of him tomorrow. But uh, while we were interviewing Nijat, we had a couple of moves uh, as this game wrapped up, Peter. So maybe we can quickly go over, let's say, the final five or six moves of the game. Starting from knight f3, we had e4, and we had this move e3 by Magnus Carlsen. Take it away from here. Yeah, knight d2. The move is super professional. Magnus just wants to make sure that he destroys white spawn structure. He does not even want to look at lines like rook takes a2, knight takes e4, and eventually white is the one who can try to play a long game against his weakness on c6. It's a typical rook-knight uh, combo. The center pawns are very important. Black's knight will be restricted. So Magnus says, no, thank you. I'm going to play the move e4, e3, I destroy your pawn structure. F takes this is not desired from the white side because then black takes on a2 and due to the pin on the second rank, White is unable to capture the c6 pawn and then remains with a ruined pawn structure. So the move knight c4 is thematic, natural. Mm -hmm. It's a fork on the rook. Now black captures the pawn on a2. White captures with the knight on e3. And again, if black would just somehow trade on c2, there would be some case to be made. For example, after knight d4, that white can sidestep with the rook, for example, to d2, eventually move the knight to c4, play the move e3, and combined his forces, more harmonious forces, thanks to the pawn structure, and play a long game. Magnus says, no, I'm going to be super precise, knight d4, hitting the rook on c2, eyeing the pawn on e2. There was nothing left for white to be precise as well. Rook takes a2, rook a2, rook c4, a timely hit at the knight on d4. And this last final touch was also a very nice, very elegant way of not removing the knight from d4, but instead going c5, the rook is forced to capture on c5 and now Magnus took with the rook, making sure that the knight remains in the center, the knight can fall back to e6. No tricky knight on e2 that white can maybe try to uh, trap with rook c4. And then it's clear that the players have to shake hands. If they want or not, they just play too good <laughs> and the draw had to be agreed. What a high accuracy game. Great, great explanation, Peter, of the final couple of moves. Almost every move in this game featured a teachable moment, featured an entertaining moment. There were so many critical moments, and they were so well handled by both players. And of course, a victory by Nijat Abbasov in sparkling fashion over a reeling Fabiano Caruana, who just isn't able to recover from his loss against Pragnananda. Folks, uh, this is just the start of an epic World Cup final. Tomorrow, we will have the second match game between Prague and Carlsen and Abbasov, who tries to hold off Fabiano Caruana and claim uh, the bronze medal. The start time, the same every day. 7 a.m. New York time, 4 a.m. over in San Francisco, uh, and uh, 1 p.m., 13 o'clock Central European Standard Time. So wherever you are, whether it's early for you or late, whether you're in bed or at work uh, or staying with relatives, you will not want to miss this second match game. Prague has such a difficult task ahead of him. The black pieces against a Magnus Carlsen who is trying to win his first ever World Cup. The narrative is set, Peter. And as we wrap up today's show, I'll pass it off to you one more time uh, for your concluding thoughts on the excellent day of chess that we bore witness to today. Yes, uh, it was a very high class affair between Pragnanda and Magnus Carlsen. We did talk about this, that in my view, after such a grueling and dramatic uh, tiebreak that we have witnessed yesterday between Caruana and Pragnanda, it was very important to have the white pieces, uh, just to make sure that you are in control. And uh, now Prague, after this game, which did not, it, it was very precise, 
it was demanding from the decision point of view, but there were no big, this emotional roller coasters or whatever. Yeah, he had everything under control. So he can recharge and be fit tomorrow. In Fabi's case, it was, I think, the, the very unfortunate coincidence that not only he ended up losing yesterday that, that match where he felt like he had so many winning chances and finally he's out of the finals, uh, but also had to play with the black pieces and Nijat Abasov somehow sensing this moment yeah, that I have to go after Fabi. I cannot just let him play a comfortable game. He came up with a very interesting new idea, set the tone, put Fabi under pressure and all this fatigue and all this disappointment of yesterday was very much visible in, in Fabi's reaction, how he handled the game. He got into trouble and then finally with a blunder with Queen before he allowed a spectacle and mating idea from Abasov and Abasov takes the lead. Incredible two games. Um, as we wrap up today's show, we wanted to shout out, uh, of course, our amazing production team who makes our job easy. Peter, uh, I'm so glad that we're back together for the finals. It's a great pleasure to commentate with you um, and an honor to uh, have, as I said before, courtside seats to watch these two amazing fighters. Uh, Prague, who is just at the beginning of what promises to be an incredible chess career. And we had over 100,000 of you watching on YouTube, 20,000 plus on Twitch. Uh, one of the most viewed broadcasts all year. And uh, I have the best job in the world. So to all of Prague's fans and Magnus' fans uh, from across the world and Prague's fans in India, you know, the whole country is behind this scintillating young junior. A huge shout out to everybody uh, for investing your time and energy into watching these games and rooting for your favorite player. On that note, we hope to see you tomorrow at 7 a.m. New York time for game two of the World Cup final. And for now, this was Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky and Grandmaster Peter Lecko wishing you a pleasant rest of your Tuesday from the World Cup. We will see you bright and early tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye.